Maureen Dutton The unsolved murder of Maureen Dutton in 1961 is perhaps one of Liverpool's most shocking and gruesome cold cases. Maureen was just 27 at the time of her death and was a typical English housewife. Her husband, Brian, was a research chemist who worked for the Imperial Chemical Industry Company, often shortened to the ICI. Just three weeks earlier, Maureen had given birth to the couple's second child. They already had a two-year-old, a little boy named David. By all accounts, the couple had a happy marriage and lived a normal life, which is perhaps why Maureen's murder was all the more disturbing and shocking to the local community. On December 21, 1961, Maureen stayed home all day at the couple's house on Thingwall Lane in the area of Nadiash. She had intended on taking David to visit the nearby Childwall Parish Church, that she didn't want to take Andrew, as it was cold and foggy out. So she called her mother-in-law, Elsie, and asked her to babysit later that day. However, Elsie had to cancel the arrangement because the fog had gotten so thick she was unable to traverse it. And so Maureen's plans were abandoned and she stayed home with her children. She was last known to be alive at around 1.30 p.m. that afternoon. Just after 6 p.m., Brian returned home from work. And was immediately suspicious when he was greeted with both darkness and silence. With two young children, the house was never quiet. Maureen was always bustling about, carrying out household tasks while caring for her two young boys. Brian's suspicions grew when he saw the family's half-eaten lunch still on the kitchen table. He moved through to the living room, and it was there he found his family. In the middle of the room was Maureen. She'd been stabbed 14 times in the chest, throat, and back. It is widely believed that David, who was sitting nearby, dazed and gazing at his mother, witnessed the crime. Andrew was in his crib nearby. The children were thought to have been alone for the best part of six hours. Investigators at the Old Swan Police Station immediately launched an inquiry into the horrific slaying of the mother of two. They believed a long-bladed knife was the murder weapon, and searched nearby bushes and shrubs for any sign of the object. They even searched drains on the streets, but turned up nothing. There was no obvious forensic evidence available. Maureen had not been sexually assaulted, and there was no signs of forced entry, nor had anything been taken from the home, all of which made it difficult for authorities to pinpoint the motive. After carrying out door-to-door -door inquiries, police discovered that nobody had been seen coming or going from the home, and nobody had heard screaming or a struggle. Then a young woman came forward with an interesting story. After seeing the newspaper report of Maureen's death, the young woman who lived in nearby Halewood told authorities that she had been visited by a young man who claimed to be a doctor. Like Maureen, the young woman had recently given birth. She assumed that the doctor had been sent to check on her. As part of her postnatal care, but this was not the case. After her husband returned from work, she told him that the doctor had indecently assaulted her, which prompted her husband to make inquiries about the so-called doctor. He was told that there was no doctor operating in the area at that time. The man was described as being between the ages of 27 and 30 wearing horn-rimmed glasses and a dark gray overcoat. On the back of this information, police theorized that Maureen had let the killer into her home under the belief that he was some kind of professional, like a doctor or a nurse. Perhaps the 27-year-old had fought back when he tried to sexually assault her and the culprit flew into a rage and attacked her with the knife. Another strange possible suspect in the case was that of the quote, good-looking stranger. This man was described as being rather young and wearing a leather jacket. He was seen several times in the vicinity of the street on the day of the crime. Witnesses saw him running very fast down the road that afternoon and not long afterwards, he was seen being violently sick outside of the Court Hay Methodist Church. One onlooker noted that the man kept his hands in his pocket the entire time he was vomiting, which they thought was very peculiar. One woman claimed they'd seen the man on the day of the incident. He had knocked on her door and stood before her clapping his hands. Frightened, the woman slammed the door on him and locked it. By January 17th, the police had gathered over 20,000 statements. With the help of witnesses, they put together a composite image of what they thought the man might have looked like. The Liverpool Echo featured the picture on the front of their paper, and within the first 24 hours of it being published, 60 people contacted authorities with information. 
However, the names that were given to the police were steadily eliminated and the man in the leather jacket was never identified. The next suspect in the case was a young blonde woman who was seen acting suspiciously when she boarded a bus close to the crime scene. This unidentified woman boarded the number 10D bus on East Prescott Road. She reportedly had an Irish accent and muttered about how she needed to leave the city immediately. Upon exiting the bus, she repeatedly said, Oh my God, the woman has never been traced and never come forward. The most bizarre theory to ever be explored in Maureen's case was done so by investigators acting under the orders of Deputy Chief Constable of Liverpool, a man named Herbert Barmer. He theorized that the 27-year-old housewife had been executed in a sacrificial killing by a Polynesian cult. Several of the cult's followers lived in Liverpool. And it was believed that they were making sacrifices to their god Tiki during the winter solstice, the time period in which Maureen was slain. The members were also known to have a tattoo of a reversed swastika. Whether this theory holds any weight at all is unknown, but it is what the deputy chief constable believed. Eventually, authorities landed on a suspect by following this theory. A 24-year-old nurse living in Upper Parliament Street was arrested and charged for stealing equipment and drugs from three Liverpool hospitals in 1962. He reportedly pretended to be a doctor and had the reversed swastika tattoo. However, the man was subsequently ruled out as being involved with the murder of Maureen and the entire theory was abandoned. Authorities regularly review the files and evidence in Maureen's case and made a fresh appeal for information as recently as 2016. Despite authorities uncovering numerous compelling suspects, Maureen's case remains unsolved. If the culprit is still alive today, it's likely they are at least in their 70s, meaning it is unlikely authorities will be able to bring them to justice. Lynn Bryant at the time of her passing in 1998, Lynn Bryant was a mother of two who'd been planning her 41st birthday celebrations. Although her case received tremendous amounts of media attention at the time, it has all but disappeared from the minds of the public today. Described by her loved ones as popular, sociable, and family-oriented, Lynn was well-liked and well-known by locals in the village where she lived. Ruan High Lanes in South Cornwall she had two daughters, 19-year-old Erin and 21-year-old Lee, who just had her own first child. The 10-month-old baby was Lynn's first grandchild, and she was looking forward to seeing her family continue to grow in the future. On the morning of Tuesday, October 20, 1998, Lynn went to work as usual. She was a cleaner for a nearby house. Upon finishing, the 40-year-old dropped in to visit her parents before returning home. At around 12.45 p.m., Lynn drove her gray Ford Sierra to Harris Garage at the village of Tregany, but she found out they were out of fuel. Next, she drove to Chenoweth Garage at Ruanghai Lanes, where she bought milk, gas, and a few groceries. While there, a scruffy white cart-arrived van was seen entering the forecourt. It was driven by an unknown bearded man. Law enforcement later noted that a similar vehicle had been seen in the days before Lynn's death, but both it and the driver were unknown to locals in the area. After visiting the garage, Lynn had lunch with her daughter Erin. The pair chatted about Lynn's upcoming birthday and watched Emmerdale between 1 and 1.30 p.m. Just after half past one, the 40-year-old took the family dog, a lurcher named Jay, out for a walk. Her family told authorities that Lynn always took the same route. Several witnesses reported seeing her on her way and told law enforcement later that nothing seemed amiss. A passing motorist saw Lynn talking to a man at the junction by Ruan High Lane's Methodist Chapel. The man is described as being clean-shaven in his 30s, about 5 foot 9 and wearing light-colored clothing. This is the last known sighting of Lynn alive. At 12.30 p.m., Lynn's body was found. By a woman driving up the lane between the chapel and Travail's Manor. Panicked, the woman reversed her car back down the road and alerted a local farmer who recognized the body. While emergency services were called, by the time the air ambulance arrived at 2.50 p.m., Lynn was long dead. She had sustained multiple knife wounds to her neck and back with the fatal blow striking her in the chest. Authorities noted that the 40-year-old had fought her attacker viciously and that her clothing was disturbed, which led them to believe she had been the victim of a sexually motivated assault. 
Law enforcement determined that the murder weapon was a single-edged blade between 10 and 14 centimeters long. It was likely either a pen knife or a small kitchen knife, but so far it has never been located, despite the fact that police immediately carried out a fingertip search of the area after Lynn's body was found. One interesting clue found at the scene was the vivid blue polyester cotton mixed fibers that were located on Lynn's body. The fibers have never been matched to a specific garment but are commonly used in both polo shirts and sweatshirts. They are alien to Lynn and her home, leading investigators to conclude that they must have come from the perpetrator. Authorities also stated that due to the struggle and the mud splatter found on the 40-year-old's clothing, they believe the culprit would have mud and blood on their clothing. Another local farmer told the police that he'd seen a man walking across his field between 2.45 and 3 p.m. This was unusual to him because there was no footpath across the area and it was never used by walkers. He noted that the man wasn't dressed for a walk or a hike either, wearing regular, everyday clothing instead. Another bizarre incident that occurred in Lynn's case was that of her tortoise shell glasses, which she had been wearing when she left the house earlier. But were not found on or with her body. They also did not turn up when the police searched the area. For months later, however, on February 2nd of 1999, the glasses were located, sitting on top of the murder at the gateway where the mother of two's body was found. Authorities have been unable to determine where they came from, suspecting that either a member of the public found them or that the perpetrator of the crime had taken them as a trophy and for some reason returned them afterwards. The investigation into Lynn's horrific murder was long. 3,144 house-to-house -house inquiry forms were completed. 1,600 alibis were established. 7,884 statements were taken and 6,573 vehicles were traced and eliminated. All men between the ages of 14 and 70 who were living in a one-mile radius of the crime scene were traced and their alibis checked and corroborated. Due to the remote location of the crime scene, authorities concluded that the culprit was either a local to the area or knew it well. Perhaps they worked nearby or had family who lived in the community. In 2015, investigators who were reviewing the case managed to pull a partial DNA profile from the evidence. Although DNA samples had been taken in 1998, authorities had to begin the process all over again with some 6,000 people in 2016. This was because new legislation, which had come into effect three years earlier, had compelled law enforcement to destroy the old samples. So far, however, these efforts have not led to an arrest or a conviction, although three suspects were cleared using the DNA profile. In 2018, on the 20th anniversary of Lynn's death, authorities put out a fresh appeal for information, which led them to receive 160 calls. 27 new leads involving 13 people came as a result. That same year, a reconstruction of the 40-year-old's last known movements was made and released to the public. The three men police wish to speak to have never come forward or been identified. These men include the man seen driving the white car arrived van, the man who spoke with Lynn at the chapel, and the man who was witnessed walking across the field. It's unknown if any of them have anything to do with the crime. In 2016, a former intelligence officer named Chris Clark put forward the theory that Lynn's case is linked with that of Helen Fleet and Kate Bushill, both of whom were murdered while dog walking. Kate Bushill was just 14 years old when she was found dead in Exwick, Exeter on November 15, 1997. She had been out walking the neighbor's dog when she was found. She had a knife wound to the neck. Helen Fleet was 66 years old when she was beaten to death while walking her dogs on March 28, 1987 in Walbury Woods in Western Supermare. Both cases have never been solved and law enforcement has never officially linked the three murders. Lynn Bryant's case also remains unsolved. Amy Ayers, Sarah Harbison, Jennifer Harbison, and Eliza Thomas all heartfelt, nature-loving teenagers were wonderful and immeasurable young girls from Austin, Texas. Their undying friendship and shared passion for all living things was cut short by unsolved murders in the waning hours of December 6, 1991, leaving all who knew them across the Texas capital and the entire state at large grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. 
As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the 1991 Austin yogurt shop murders and the horrifying tragedy left in the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt storeroom. The youngest of the four girls was Amy Liers. Born on the final day of January in the winter of 1978, she was quickly introduced into the ranching culture and cowgirl lifestyle that the open plains of Texas can inspire. From a young age, she became obsessed with the outdoors and all that Mother Nature had to offer, finding a special affinity for animals and associating with them in her free time. Her two major interests were fishing and horses, falling in love with competition shows. As young as three years old, Amy excelled in horse shows across the state of Texas. She even learned the art of cutting horses, in which a horse and its rider attempt to separate a cow from its herd and keep it singled out. It was a fine equestrian skill to master, let alone for a young girl. In short, Amy was born to be a horse whisperer. These deep-rooted passions carried on into her adolescent years as well. When she wasn't hanging around the horse barn, she was training her dogs new tricks or making friends with strangers' pets, withholding the uncanny ability to attract animals on the fly, as if her energy and spirit made them draw near. She took this spirit wherever she went, whether it was to the rodeo to support her brother, Sean, or to her meetings with the fellow yearbook staff at Burnett Middle School. After classes ended, Amy would venture to Lanier High School's Junior Future Farmers of America, where she served as vice president or to the Travis County Livestock Show where she would show hogs and join arts and crafts programs. It was all prep for her master plan as Amy dreamt of one day owning horses on open farmland while tending to animals as a veterinarian. With so much natural talents, we can be sure that these dreams would have materialized had it not been for that fateful final journey to the yogurt shop with a friend in late 1991. The next youngest victim, Amy Ayers, a aforementioned best friend, was 15-year-old Sarah Harbison. Born on October 28, 1976, Sarah was the younger of two daughters belonging to stepfather Frank and birth mother, Barbara Harbison. In 1979, Barbara and her daughters moved to Austin and Sarah never looked back. Much like her future best friend, Amy, Sarah displayed a love for outdoor activities and wielded a competitive spirit at an early age. She loved playing sports, especially basketball. She just loved being a part of something and forcing herself to be better at whatever she set her mind on. Sarah never slowed down either, taking on as many activities as she could. Alongside basketball, Sarah also joined the cheerleading squad and would cheer directly after her own basketball game, supporting the boys' teams too. When she got into high school, she also excelled on the freshman volleyball squad too. This hectic lifestyle didn't bother Mr. and Mrs. Harverson though, as they pushed Sarah to achieve greatness and follow her passions. Thus, Sarah joined other organizations at school, such as the Lanier FFA chapter, and became a representative on her high school student council. But her very favorite extracurricular activity, showing sheep at local county fair competitions, was shared with her older sister, Jennifer, another victim of the yogurt shop mystery. Jennifer Harbison, the eldest child of Barbara Harbison, was born on May 9, 1974, two and a half years prior to Sarah. She, her mother and her sister had an inseparable bond growing up. In 1980, Barbara married Frank and the family of three grew to four, cemented with true happiness and consistent support. Through this support, Jennifer was much like her younger sister in that she was encouraged to live up to her imaginations. She was short and petite, quick and clever, but equally as confident and athletic. She loved to remain social at school, also channeling most of her energy into sports and the Future Farmers of America program, where she served as president of the local chapter and vice president of the district. She led the sports fandom between her and Sarah. Playing t-ball as a youngster before becoming a stellar track and field star in high school. She used her athletic abilities to ready herself for a future career in rodeo barrel races, the perfect dream for a girl with her interests. Without a doubt, she and Sarah held many similarities in their close relationship, their mother describing them as wonderfully unique, faithful, and most of all, mature for their age. It was Jennifer's maturity that prodded Barbara to allow her to work part-time late night shifts at a minimum wage job at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt Shop so she could help pay for a navy blue Chevy S10 truck her birth father was wrangling for her. 
In a heartbreaking twist, it was this innocent plan that led into darkness after a few months on the job for Jennifer and her older co-worker, Eliza Thomas. Eliza Thomas was born on May 16, 1974 in Travis County, Texas. Her parents divorced when she was only a child, but she remained tight-knit with her birth mother, Maria, and grew up with her younger sister, Sonora Thomas. Like many of her friends and fellow Mid-Texas natives, Eliza was fond of country music and dancing. When she became a teenager, Eliza and her best friend at the time, Michelle, would go out together to dance events. Maria Thomas would tell reporter Dick Ellis after the murders that her favorite memories of her late daughter were the times when Eliza and Michelle would meet up before or after dancing, get dressed up with nice clothes and makeup, and laugh through the homemade photo shoots. It was this youthful ritual that inspired Eliza to dream of becoming a model someday, with her expertise in beauty products a facet of her career goals. When she wasn't collecting tubes of lipstick, she was looking for the newest little knickknacks to add to her miniature collection, mostly made up of cats' figurines. Much like her friends, Jennifer, Sarah, and Amy, she too loved animals and the Future Farmers of America program. In fact, she used these activities to support her modeling aspirations, selling the pigs she'd show at county competitions to fund her first modeling portfolio. It was also a big reason why she also got a job as the night shift closer at the local yogurt shop. And sadly, why she passed away far too soon, along with the three other innocent girls of Austin, Texas in December of 1991. Let's now turn to the timeline of events leading up to the Austin yogurt shop murders. At around 4.30 p.m. on Friday, December 6, 1991, Barbara Harbison returns home from work to find her youngest daughter, Sarah Harbison, sitting on the couch, eating a snack. Sarah informs her mother that she's going out that night with her friend, Amy Ayers, and asks if Amy can spend the night with them. Barbara agrees and tells Sarah she and Amy can get a ride from her eldest daughter, Jennifer Harbison, to a mall near Jennifer's work and then a ride home after her shift ends. A few minutes later, Jennifer returns home from school to prep for work. Her mother and sister tell her of their plan, and she happily agrees. Sometime after 5 p.m., Jennifer and Sarah depart the Harbison household for the Austin shopping complex, the last time Barbara sees her children. Jennifer drops off Sarah and Amy at the mall and clocks in for the closing shift at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop at 2949 W. Anderson Lane with her co-worker, Eliza Thomas. Over the next four hours or so, the night shift at the yogurt shop operates as usual. At around 10 p.m., customers at the store report seeing all the girls inside. Happy and acting normally. This would be the last confirmed time that Eliza, Jennifer, Sarah and Amy are seen alive. Sometime within the next hour and 47 minutes, assumed to be around 11 p.m., the four friends are entrapped at the yogurt store by multiple assailants. The offenders gag, sexually assault, and eventually murder the girls in cold blood via gunshots to the head with 22 caliber lead bullets. They stack the bodies in the shop's storeroom, pour accelerants around the crime scene, light it all on fire, and escape into the thick of night. At exactly 11.47 p.m., the same night, Austin police officer Troy Gay patrols the Anderson Line, North Austin area. He spots a fire burning at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop and calls it into his dispatcher. Austin police backup arrive on the scene and just after midnight on Saturday, December 7, authorities discover the dead bodies of Eliza, Jennifer, Sarah, and Amy. Eliza and Sarah are found with their wrists tied, with Jennifer's unbound, but her hands positioned behind her back. Their corpses are nude and charred almost beyond recognition. Amy's body is found in another section of the store, a sock-like cloth tied around her neck, with second-degree burns on about 30% of her body. It's theorized the bodies were stacked on top of each other, with Amy escaping the pile and crawling away before being shot once more. All the girls are presumed to have died before being burned. A few days later, on Monday, December 9th, law enforcement confirms reports that there were multiple people involved in the robbery turned homicide, and there were no signs of forced entry and that the items used to tie up the four girls were all found in the store that night. The following day on Tuesday, December 10th, the city of Austin, Texas grieves with the various parents over the loss of their four children. A funeral is held and it is attended by over 1,500 citizens. 
On Thursday, December 12, State District Judge John Wisser sealed the autopsy reports to sustain the evidence's confidentiality and protect the investigation. At North Cross Mall on Saturday, December 14, a man by the name of Maurice Pierce is arrested for possession of a .22 caliber gun and bullets. Austin Police Detective Hector Polanco brings him into question in regards to the yogurt shop murders. And Pierce eventually tells the detective that his friend, Forrest Wellborn, used the .22 gun in the four girls' murders. Despite this development, police report that they have few leads on December 23rd. After a false confession by an anonymous teenage girl and her boyfriend are proven untrue. To make matters worse, the Maurice Pierce tip is buried in case files after the interrogating officer, Detective Polanco, is removed from the investigation due to his dirty past in coercing false confessions from suspects on March 23, 1992. Seven months later, in October, 1992, the next best lead evaporates when Paverio Villa Saavedra, a suspect that Mexican police say confessed to his involvement, recants his testimony, telling American authorities that Mexican federal agents tortured him into coercion. Over the next three to four years, leads pour into the Austin police departments, but no arrests are made, and the yogurt shop murders quickly begin to devolve into a tragic, cold case. However, sometime at the end of 1996 or the beginning of 1997, APD Detective Paul Johnson is newly assigned to tackle the murders and pulls the old Maurice Pierce tip case file for closer inspection. The testimony isn't acted upon until early 1999 when forensic officers test Pierce's 22 caliber gun against the crime scene evidence. They find it does not match the weapon used at the yogurt shop. Nevertheless, police bring in one of Maurice Pierce's alleged cohorts, Michael Scott, multiple times between September 9th and 14th, 1999. After over 20 hours of intense interrogations, Scott confesses to playing a role in the murders. On September 15th, Austin police travel to Charleston, West Virginia, where they interview another alleged cohort, Robert Burns Springsteen IV. Springsteen is interrogated under scrutiny for five hours, before admitting to raping Amy Ayers and helping kill the others. A couple of weeks later, on October 5, 1999, Austin Judge Mike Lynch signed the arrest warrants for Scott, Springsteen, Maurice Pierce, and Forrest Wellborn. They are officially arrested the following day, on October 6, for capital murder. Later that year, on December 1, police collect the four suspects' blood and DNA samples for crime scene analysis. Eight days later, on December 9th, another judge rules Pierce and Wellborn will be tried as adults, despite being just 15 and 16. On December 14th, Robert Springsteen is indicted by a grand jury, followed by Michael Scott and Maurice Pierce on December 28th. He District Attorney Ronnie Earle says he will seek the death penalty for both Springsteen and Scott. In another twist though, a different judge dismisses the capital murder charge against Forrest Wellborn on June 30, 2000, after a second jury fails to indict him. Despite the lack of physical evidence against him, prosecutors continue with their case against Robert Springsteen in April of 2001. At the conclusion of the trial, the jury finds Springsteen guilty of murder. And in June of 2001, Springsteen is sentenced to death. Sixteen months pass by. And a similar conclusion to Michael Scott's trial is reached when he's found guilty of murder on September 22, 2002, and sentenced to life in prison on September 24. However, a few months later, on January 28, 2003, District Attorney Ronnie Earl asked for a dismissal of the charges against Maurice Pierce, claiming there wasn't enough evidence to convict him in the moment, and Pierce is released after spending over three years in prison. It wouldn't be until three years later, on May 30, 2006, when the Texas Court of Criminal Appeals overturned Springsteen's conviction, claiming that the written confession of Michael Scott was improperly used against Springsteen in his own testimony. This exact same reasoning is used again on June 6, 2007, when the court overturned Scott's conviction as well. In a bombshell announcement by prosecutors in the spring of 2008, they report that advances in DNA technology have revealed that a previous piece of undetected DNA from an unknown male subject was discovered on a vaginal swab taken from Amy Yes' body. This DNA profile does not match any of the four original suspects. This same DNA profile is found on the body of one of the Harbison sisters in June of 2009 and matches none. 
Of the over 100 suspects the police have looked into thus far, nor any of the forensic officers or medical personnel who had dealt with the corpses in the years since December 1991. Later that month, on June 24, 2009, the DA's office tells a Travis County judge that they are no longer prepared for a retrial against Michael Scott or Robert Springsteen without the identity of the man to whom the new DNA belongs. At 2.50 p.m., the two men walk out of the courthouse with their attorneys, finally free men. In October of 2009, all charges are officially dropped against Scott and Springsteen. In the 11-plus years since the wrongful arrests of Maurice Pierce, Forrest Wellborn, Michael Scott, and Robert Springsteen, and almost 19 years since the tragic assaults and murders of Amy Ayers, Sarah Harbison, Jennifer Harbison, and Eliza Thomas, no matches of the DNA samples found at the yogurt crime scene have been announced and there are currently no known active leads in the investigation. Without a doubt, the biggest piece of evidence discovered in the yogurt shop murder investigation is the mysterious DNA profile belonging to an unidentified male, found on two of the four bodies after DNA technology expanded at the turn of the millennium. While not much is known about the sample outside of the gender of its donor, it's been announced that the profile does not match any of the tested suspects police have compiled since their manhunt began. Nor does it match hundreds of associates of the prime suspects listed by the Austin Police Department thus far. Technicians have been ruled out, fellow law enforcement officers have been ruled out, the first responders have been ruled out. This means the DNA most certainly belongs to one of the men responsible for these harrowing acts of rape and murder. As we await the results of further testing and for a match to be uncovered, another set of points to the case are critical in understanding how hurtful the authorities were in their brutal mishandling of suspects early on and how the deception of the police may have derailed the entire investigation through their despicable use of coercion and eliciting false confessions. Had Detective Hector Polanco not intimidated Maurice Pierce into claiming his 22 caliber gun was the one used in the homicides by his friend, Forrest Wellborn, investigators would never have followed up this false lead and would never have arrested two innocent men along with their supposed cohorts, Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen. Instead, they could have focused their time, money and energies into finding a viable suspect. Police and prosecutors alike knew the four men had no physical connection to the yogurt shop as well as having the knowledge that Pierce's gun wasn't the murder weapon. So to cover up their ineptitude, they turn to the bad cop routine. It is a tale we have seen far too often. If you want a better idea of how detectives coerced false confessions from four young boys, hampering the search for true justice and destroying four more innocent lives in the process, you can listen to clips of these coerced confessions by following the link in the show notes. You'll hear audio clips from the elongated interrogations, full of persuasive tactics utilized by cops who want pleas of guilt to spill out of the tired minds of innocent people. Mike, look at me. You're remembering what happened this city room time there, right? I don't, you're remembering what happened. I don't honestly remember going in the toilet. Imagine being an underage boy brought in by police officers for a crime you didn't commit. Cornered in a windowless, low-lit room by men twice your size, demanding you say what they want to hear, bullying images into your malleable minds, forcing false memories upon you. Is that the gun you walked up behind somebody with and shot in the head? Not only that, but the officers used each man's false confession against the other, tricking them into believing that their friend was right and to deny it would be to deny the other's seemingly true story. It's a crippling, debilitating sensation and one that took precious years away from a proper investigation into finding the real killers. The Austin Police Department and Travis County Prosecutor's Office should be ashamed to the highest degree and must take the blame. Their rush to create answers where there obviously were none cost the victims' families the justice they deserved. It is inexcusable and disgusting behavior. Yet vital to understand in grasping the entire picture of the failed and fractured yogurt shop case files. We can now turn to the most prominent theories surrounding the mystery of the Austin yogurt shop murders. The wildest part about the yogurt shop murders and its notoriety for the coerced confessions is that it didn't stop with the four main suspects believed to be responsible for years until DNA cleared their names. In fact, investigators heard over 50 false confessions related to the case, including one from infamous serial killer, Kenneth Allen McDuff. 
Macduff's testimony coming the day of his execution was at first seriously considered by police when they realized he was in the Austin area around the time of the yogurt shop massacre. Murdering Colleen Reed with accomplice Alva Hank Worley on December 29. At 1991. However, after exhaustive investigative measures were taken, it was found that these claims by Macduff were false, a disturbing trend for a case lacking more and more clarity by the day. So why did so many people come forward with fake motives and lead authorities astray, distracting everyone from the real culprit still running free? For some like Macduff, it was perfect fodder to receive their twisted 15 minutes of fame. These instigators deserve absolutely no recognition and should not be named, as their falsifications take away from the serious matter at hand. For others, false confessions might have come from further malpractices taken by Austin police and case detectives, who had the previously mentioned history in pulling the trigger on coercion. If the four boys were manipulated into confessing for the case to be fast-tracked to the solved folder, it's not out of the realm of possibility that others were subjected to similar tactics. Again, it goes without saying these awful investigative patterns damaged the case, and the police who took them were criminals in their own right. So while the police were wasting time putting figurative and even literal guns to the heads of innocent parties, what other theories were discussed among case followers and armchair sleuths? The craziest and most ill-advised theory was purported in court by the prosecutor's office after Pierce, Wellborn, Scott, and Springsteen were cleared by DNA evidence. They claimed that they still believed the four men were guilty, but that a mysterious fifth cohort was the donor of the DNA profile. This theory was nothing. But a desperate attempt by APD and the district attorney to save face in an obviously bungled prosecution effort that shouldn't be considered further as anything but a coward's last attempt to frame four innocent men. Another string of theories discussed across the message boards and email chains revolved around possible serial killer suspects. After Kenneth Macduff was ruled out, sleuths started pointing out other murderers with similar MOs. The most frequently mentioned was Paul Dennis Reed, also known as the fast food killer, convicted of seven murders over a string of three fast food chain robberies from February to April of 1997. Reed killed his victims in a similar fashion to the yogurt shop murderer, bringing them to the building store room, binding them at the wrists, and shooting them in the head, execution style. While these slayings happened in Nashville, Tennessee, Reed had a criminal history in Texas, dating all the way back to 1983, getting out of prison for an armed robbery charge in 1990. However, because Reed was eventually apprehended, his DNA records would have been entered into a criminal database and subsequently ruled out as a match to the yogurt shop murders. Reed also operated alone and dealt with mental disabilities according to his family. Going against yogurt shop crime scene evidence that there were multiple offenders who were likely skilled criminals operating with precision. These data points also most likely rule out involvement of the gunman in the Lane Bryant shooting mystery that took place on February 22, 2008. Despite the vast amount of time between the Lane Bryant case and the yogurt shop case, it's hard for people to ignore the similarities in crime scenes. The Lane Bryant shootings also involved all female victims who were executed via gunshots to the head after being trapped in the back of their store. Ultimately, there was one victim who survived and told police that the gunman was working alone. And for a case that took place in Illinois, a thousand miles away and 17 years apart from the yogurt shop case, a link between the two is highly improbable. Of all the theories put forth by the community surrounding the case, there is one hypothesis that stands out from the rest, an idea about who the killers might be built from a couple of eyewitness testimonies gathered by the consumers at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt Shop the night of the massacre. These statements place two unidentified men sitting at a booth after 10 p.m., coming across as odd and emitting a peculiar aura. The first man was described as white, standing at around 5 feet 6 inches in his late 20s or early 30s, sporting dirty blonde hair and a large black jacket. The second figure was described as much bigger, a 6-foot white male of average build with darker hair and an elongated pointy nose, sporting a green military fatigue-type jacket. He spoke with a deep, yet crystal-clear voice. The first customer to speak out against the two men was Daryl Croft, who testified for defense lawyers in Michael Scott's criminal trial in 2002. 
Croft, a former police officer and security manager in 1991, had visited the Austin yogurt shop at just about 10 p.m. on December 6 with two friends. He recollected how when he went to go stand in line, a man wearing a green military fatigue jacket matching the description of the second man was loitering, asking other customers to go in front of him so he'd be at the back of the line. When he approached Croft, he actually asked him if he was a former cop and if he'd jump ahead of him in line. Croft denied his bizarre request and monitored the man as he made his way to the counter and ordered a soft drink. Once he paid for the beverage, the man then slinked around the counter and walked into the back of the store. Croft, growing more and more suspicious, asked Eliza Thomas, who was working the cash register, why the man was allowed back there. She informed Croft that the man had asked to use their restroom, and she gave him permission, acting as the shift supervisor. But Croft couldn't shake the strangeness of the incident and waited around the front counter for a few minutes longer than normal, waiting to see if the man in the green jacket returned. When he failed to show up, Croft left the store with his friends, but reported the description of the man to the police a few days after the murders were reported on. For reasons unknown, a police sketch of the man in the military jacket was never procured, and Croft failed to pick a recognizable face out of a couple of suspect lineups in the aftermath, lineups that included the four innocent boys. The other major testimony regarding the two men was pulled from old police statements by the Austin Chronicle for a story published by reporter Jordan Smith in December of 2011. These statements came from a female customer who told police she and her husband were two of the last customers at the yogurt shop just before closing at 11 p.m. on the night of December 6. They reported seeing the same two jacketed men sitting in a booth acting in a way that made the woman's skin crawl. She watched them in the reflection of the shop's front window as the girls began to close up the shop by refilling napkin holders, cleaning floors, and flipping chairs on top of tables. Even as the couple left, the two men remained in their seats, acting as if they weren't going anywhere soon as Jennifer Harbison locked the door and flipped the sign to read closed, as to dissuade any new customers from entering. The girls inside acted normally, but according to the couple, the men. It did not. It's hard not to find these shared experiences rather intriguing. These two men have not been named or cleared by authorities. For all we know, they were never tracked down by police nor interviewed. Law enforcement has stated that they are interested in speaking to the two men, but as witnesses rather than suspects. However, considering their uncomfortable vibes and peculiar behavior, those who consider them suspects have good reason to do so. In one of the crime scene photographs taken the morning after the murders, you can see a booth in the background of the dining area that has an empty napkin dispenser and cleared tabletop. When customers were shown the photo, they agreed it was likely the booth the two suspicious men sat at. This means that the murders happened in between the men leaving and the girls being able to finish up closing their booth. A very slim amount of time, considering they were in the middle of clearing the tables. Thus, if the two men aren't responsible, they at least had the best shot at spotting the real killers, making the mystery of the unidentified male closing customers the most puzzling and important of all. Before we divulge our hypothesis of the 1991 Austin Yogurt Shop Unsolved Murders, we want to make it known our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective are purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each video, and we do not attempt to promise certainty or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in closing. We simply observe, research, and report. For starters, we believe that these murders were indeed the actions of multiple assailants or a killer with at least one other accomplice. The evidence hides in the simple fact it would be next to impossible for a single perpetrator to subdue all four girls by themselves, take them to the back storeroom, tie them up, and set the entire place on fire without causing a ruckus. There are two key pieces of data to support this. Remember. None of the neighboring businesses at the strip mall where the yogurt shop was located reported hearing anything to suggest murder the night of December 6th. One business did say they heard a few popping noises, most likely the gunshots, but nobody heard screaming or shouting or banging or anything to suggest a desperate fight was put up. If there were multiple offenders, keeping everything quiet would have been a much easier task. 
The young girls, friends, and families agree with this, stating that their courage and tough murder personalities would be too much for one person with one gun to overcome. Secondly, we are confident that these murders were orchestrated by career criminals and likely sociopaths who were seeking to attack women with the resources to do so without detection. These horrific crimes were not carried out by high school boys attempting to rob the neighborhood yogurt stand. Rather, they were premeditated acts of violence, people who sought to harm and strike fear in their victims. The reason the killings are more than likely not a simple robbery gone wrong is the presence of an accelerant around the storeroom after the fire was put out. Most criminals do not bring lighter fluid along with their robberies, usually seeking to run in and out of their target and leave without physical conflict. Plus, there were plenty of other shops around the area that would have provided much more cash than the yogurt shop did. No, we believe these murders were intentional from the beginning. It is highly possible that the men who murdered the girls were watching one of them from afar. Maybe even prior to December 6th, they could have made Amy and Sarah targets after spotting them at the mall without parental supervision, a popular spot for offenders to track unsuspecting women. While there is no evidence to suggest this, it cannot be ruled out when considering these killers were concise in how they acted and the history of violence against young women in general. So who could the killers be? While it is impossible to know for sure, we believe those two jacketed men previously mentioned are the most fitting suspects. They were acting suspiciously, bothersome to multiple customers, and were the only two of over 50 customers that evening that have yet to be accounted for. Not only that, but the story by Daryl Croft leaves us wondering if that tall man in the green jacket wasn't just going back to use the restroom. But rather scoping the shop for cameras, or worse, a place to commit a future assault. They were the last two people seen with the girls and wearing clothes that could have concealed weapons. Of course, this is all circumstantial evidence. However, it is also curious that the two men who were lurking in the booth at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt shop on December 6th have not come forward to absolve themselves of any further suspicion. They could have effortlessly cleared their names and identities through science, submitting DNA to be compared to the sample obtained by police. Until that happens, they are the greatest suspects we have and must be found to unlock further answers regarding the entire mystery. Until then, we must keep the faith that the DNA profile currently held in evidence can be used to help aid investigators. Sadly, the type of DNA sample received, a YSTR strand, also known as mitochondrial DNA, isn't the kind one can simply input into a genealogy database and connect it to relatives. While it can rule out suspects when compared with direct DNA donations, it's hard to be used as a backwards investigative tool, like the DNA was used for cases in the Golden State Killer investigation. Not only this, but the FBI has withheld the DNA sample from such genealogy studies anyway, claiming privacy laws to be complicating its potential use in further DNA campaigns. Still, we will hold out hope that a breakthrough is just around the corner. And in the meantime, we will celebrate the lives of Amy Ayers, Sarah Harbison, Jennifer Harbison, and Eliza Thomas. We will champion their unique personalities, shared passions, and their unparalleled drive to be nothing but unapologetically themselves. We will spread the hope and happiness and heartfelt courage those four girls emanated in their daily lives, never missing an opportunity to inspire those around them. We will remember their athletic feats, their unmatched equestrian skill sets, their farming expertise and their community-driven spirits. We will remind the world that these were four young women full of promise, navigating their mid-Texas neighborhoods so that one day they could move out to new pastures and shape the world at large for the better. The tragic rape and murder at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt Shop on the night of December 6, 1991 will not be the defining legacies of Amy, Sarah, Jennifer, and Eliza. Their legacies are defined by every positive and life-affirming moment before, defined by their love for both nature and humanity. This is a type of love that is not burned or broken, no matter the circumstances of their final moments. It is the reason their memory will never perish as we continue a search for their justice into the infinite night. Khadija Britton Born April 22nd of 1994, Khadija Rose Britton was described by her loved ones as a bright and athletic teenager who was sure to go far in life. A member of the Round Valley Indian tribes of the Round Valley Reservation, Khadija grew up in Covillo, California and was an accomplished student who was also the star of her high school basketball team. 
Her friends and classmates noted that she was popular and confident. With a strong sense of humor. Everyone was certain that as a young woman, she would break away from her hometown and go to college. But Khadija had that opportunity robbed of her in the early months of 2018. It was the night of February 7, 2018 that Khadija was last seen alive. Three days passed before her family filed a missing person report after hearing nothing from her. It's not that her family were unconcerned. It was more that in the last few years, Khadija had begun to live an increasingly unpredictable lifestyle. Instead of leaving to go to community college after graduating high school in 2012, she began to fall in with the wrong crowd. It wasn't long before she'd become involved in abusing drugs. Her community was known to be suffering from both drug and alcohol issues. Through her substance abuse, Khadija got to know a man named Niji Tony Fallis for, who was around 14 years her senior. Although she didn't know it right away, Fallis was bad news. He'd had far more than his fair share of brushes with the law and had been charged with numerous offenses, ranging from manufacturing meth to endangering the health of a child to domestic violence. He'd even had his children taken from his custody after keeping them in filthy, squalid conditions. However, he appeared to father more children after his stint in prison in San Joaquin County because shortly after he met Khadija, she was in charge of his children. She would do their laundry, cook their meals and collect them from school. While friends and family were unimpressed by Khadija's choice of boyfriends, their complaints and concerns fell on deaf ears. On January 30, 2018, a hysterical, bleeding, and bruised Khadija turned up on the doorstep of the house belonging to her father, stepmother, and their children. She told the couple about how Phallus had beaten her with his fists before picking up a hammer. The next day, working with the tribe's domestic violence center, Khadija filed a restraining order against her boyfriend. She was also given money to replace the possessions she'd left behind at his home, including her clothes and phone. Ultimately, however, Phallus managed to dissuade or force the 23-year-old not to follow through with the charges against him. This is thought to have been because, given his criminal history, Phallus would have spent considerable time in jail had the charges been successful. However, that was not the end. After Khadija was reported missing on February 10, 2018, a witness came forward to police with a horrific story. On the night of her disappearance, Khadija was known to have been visiting a friend in the 23,000 block of Airport Road. The witness claimed that around midnight, Phallus, accompanied by his new girlfriend, a woman named Antonia, turned up at the house in a black Mercedes. Armed with a small pistol, Phallus went to the door of the house and demanded that Khadija come out and speak with him. After this, a physical altercation ensued and Phallus began to chase his ex-girlfriend around the car, which was being driven by Antonia. Phallus managed to hit Khadija and shove her into the car, and the three drove off together. The 23-year-old was never seen since. Ten days later, in mid-February, Phallus was charged with multiple offenses in connection with the disappearance of Khadija, including assault, kidnapping, first-degree burglary, threats to commit a crime resulting in death or great bodily injury, attempted murder, and for being a felon in possession of a firearm and ammunition. However, Phallus pled not guilty and refused to cooperate with detectives who were investigating the vanishing of his ex-girlfriend. Several months later in June of 2018, the police were forced to drop most of the charges due to a lack of evidence. Fallis bail was reduced and he was released shortly afterwards, although he still faced the gun and ammunition possession charges. In August, Antonia was arrested for suspicion of harboring or concealing a wanted felon. A few months later in October, Fallis pled no contest to the firearm charges, while his girlfriend pled no contest to being an accessory to a felony. Phallus, who was 37 at the time, was sentenced to four years in prison, while Antonia was sentenced to 18 months in prison and 18 months under supervision. She was also ordered to have no further contact with her boyfriend and was forced to spend six months in an inpatient drug rehabilitation program. Both detectives and Khadija's family believe that Phallus kills the 23-year-old on the night she was taken. The problem is they're unable to prove it without first finding her body. During the investigation, authorities questioned and arrested many of Fallis associates. They also set up an anonymous tip line. And missing persons posters were plastered all across the surrounding counties. 
Meanwhile, friends and family did their best to raise awareness for Khadija's case on social media, including setting up a Facebook group. In 2019, a pond in Mendocino County was drained when cadaver dogs indicated that something was buried there. However, no human remains were found. Lieutenant Shannon Barney of the Mendocino County Sheriff's Office, who was also a member of the reservation, said in a 2018 article that he believed somebody knew what happened and where Khadija was, but they were keeping quiet, telling the press Democrats, quote, throughout the ages, tribal people have closed down, among their own, within their own little tribal system and for protection. That's part of the culture. We know there are people who know more than they're telling us, but we have not been able to break through that tribalism. In 2018, a $50,000 reward was made available. That reward was doubled in 2020 with the help of the FBI, who have been assisting in the investigation. Khadija's family continued to look for answers. In March of 2018, her father, Jerry, and one of her brothers searched for her in the snowy landscape of the Mendocino National Forest after receiving a tip. When their SUV got stuck, the pair continued on foot, but their efforts proved fruitless. Abandoned buildings and chicken coops have been investigated by Jerry, who takes a shovel when he goes out with him, so he can check out any shallow graves. Although the perpetrator in this case seems obvious, the family have still not received closure or justice. Khadija's body has still not been recovered, and it's likely that without it, Fallas will not be charged. The case is still open and active. Kiara Coles Born September 24, 1992 to Joseph Coles and Karen Phillips, Kiera was the fourth of five children and appeared to have a relatively normal upbringing. As an adult, she was close to her mother. The pair spoke on a near-daily basis, and she was also very anxious to start her own family. Kiera often told her family and friends that as soon as she was financially stable, she wanted to have her first child. Shortly before her vanishing, she was on her way to having her perfect life. She had moved out to her own apartment on the south side of Chicago, Illinois, and she had purchased a new car. She had also recently found out that she was pregnant. Her baby was due in April of 2019. 26-year-old Kiera was working for the USPS at the time of her disappearance. According to some reports, she had been there since 2017. While other sources claim she'd been there about three years. According to her mother, Karen, Kiera had taken the 1st and 2nd of October 2018 off from work for personal reasons. She was due back on the 3rd. However, the 26-year-old never showed up to her shift. Instead, she called in sick. Between the 3rd and the 4th of October, Karen continued to call her daughter, who wasn't answering her phone. The calls were going straight to voicemail. Leading Karen to believe that Kiera's phone must have been out of battery. She then asked Kiera's sibling to check her social media. Kiera hadn't posted there either. Beginning to grow concerned, Karen asked the Chicago Police Department to perform a welfare check on her daughter. Kiera's car was still parked outside her apartment block, but the young woman herself was missing. Initially, police didn't think much of Kiera's vanishing, believing it to be a non-suspicious case. But eventually they began to suspect foul play. Karen had last seen her daughter on the Sunday before she vanished, September 30th. The pair had spoken about Kiera's preparation for the baby and what milk was best to drink while she was pregnant. However, the case grew a little complicated when the 26-year-old sister claimed that she had last seen her on Monday the 1st after picking her up from work. This statement conflicted with Karen's testimony. That her daughter had taken Monday the 1st and Tuesday the 2nd off from work. This information has never been fully clarified in subsequent reports on the disappearance. Upon investigating further, the case grew all the more complex when authorities found out that the father of Kiera's baby, Joshua Simmons, whom she'd been seeing for five years, actually already had a long-term girlfriend and several children. There are also some reports that he had a third girlfriend. Although this is only mentioned in a few articles, not only was Kiera pregnant, but Simmons' long-term girlfriend was also pregnant with their third child. Reportedly, both Kiera and the other girlfriend knew of one another. According to Karen, the pair did not get on, and Kiera had been banned from visiting Simmons at his house. It is unclear if the authorities ever spoke with Simmons. 
In early 2019, he was wanted for questioning in relation to Kiera's case. Reportedly, after the 26-year-old vanished, Simmons, his girlfriend, and their children moved out of state. They never participated in any searches for Kiera nor any vigils. NBC5 found Simmons living in Louisiana in 2021, but he failed to reply to any of their letters. Following her disappearance, investigators found CCTV footage from a neighbor's surveillance camera, which showed a woman resembling Kiera walking toward her car on the morning of October 3rd. The woman was possibly wearing a postal worker uniform, although this has been heavily debated. The woman appeared to spot something out of frame and walk towards it. She didn't appear fearful or hesitant as she passed by Kiera's car and disappeared from view. Her movements led some to speculate that she had seen someone she knew or a car she recognized and walked towards it. Over the years, this footage has been subject to much scrutiny. At first, the Coles believed that this was their missing loved one. Over time, however, they have changed their minds. Most notably, Karen came forward earlier this year to tell the media that she never believed the woman was Kiera, but that authorities had asked her to keep quiet about her suspicions. Karen explained that the woman's gait and the shape of her body did not match that of her daughter. She also added that she was only revealing this information now. Because the investigation had stalled and she felt she had nothing to lose. The USPS for their part also does not believe that the woman in the footage is Kiera, but another postal worker who was on that route that day. In February of 2021, Karen also revealed that another neighbor had come forward with CCTV footage from the night of October 2nd. The video showed Kiera and Simmons leaving her apartment in separate vehicles. Investigators told the media that they had also recovered surveillance images of the 26-year-old withdrawing $400 from her bank accounts before handing it over to Simmons. It's unclear if Kiera's bank account has been used in the years since she vanished. After Kiera disappeared, her phone, bag and lunchbox were recovered from her car. Meanwhile, her keys and purse were found in her apartment. Online sleuths have noted that the lunchbox being found in the car was odd. Given that she had supposedly called in sick. This phone call has been a controversial part of the case online. Many armchair detectives have suggested that perhaps someone called in sick pretending to be the 26-year-old. Her family have been unable to confirm if the phone call was in her call log as they have been unable to access her phone without her passcode. It's unknown why authorities haven't looked into this. The USPS worker who took Kiera's call is adamant. That it was her. Authorities also searched Whistler Woods Forest Preserve in Riverdale after following some anonymous tips they'd received. While a few bones were discovered at the scene, it's unknown if they were animal or human. Many areas in and around Chicago were searched, but all to no avail. A reward of $50,000 was also set up, although it has yet to be claimed. Kiera's family are desperate to bring her home and hopefully meet her baby. Her father, Joseph, quit his job in Wisconsin and moved to Chicago following the disappearance. He has spoken frequently about the case online and to the media and has handed out flyers on the street. For a period of time, he lived in his car outside of Kiera's apartment block, determined to find answers. The 26-year-old's friends and co-workers also continue to tirelessly spread awareness of her case. Even today, Joseph continues to hold meetings to spread awareness about his daughter's disappearance. In 2020, he said that he believed Kiera was alive, but being held captive in a vacant home. He added that he believed authorities had not done enough to help bring her back. In July of 2020, law enforcement announced that the investigation was suspended because they had exhausted all leads. They have stated that they still suspect Kiera met with foul play, but have otherwise been tight-lipped. They told the media that they are looking for evidence to back up their theory and that they believe two or three people were involved with the 26-year-old's disappearance. In September of 2020, the Chicago Police Department told the Chicago Tribune that they were working with the U.S. Postal Inspection Service and the FBI to continue the search. They also noted that the case was not closed. And they'd be investigating any new evidence or tips they received. Although there isn't much in the way of evidence in Kiera's case, there is a lot of speculation online. The most common theory is that Joshua Simmons was involved in Kiera's disappearance, with some even suggesting that his girlfriend was also involved. 
Amateur sleuths came to this conclusion after noting the way the couple left Illinois in the aftermath of the vanishing. And that neither helped with the investigation or the search. Some have theorized that it was done out of jealousy, but others have proposed that neither half of the couple wanted anything to do with Kiera's baby, and so they sought to rid themselves of the problem. Karen has said that while she initially didn't believe that Simmons was capable of harming her daughter, his silence has caused her to think otherwise. Another theory that has been proposed in Kiera's case is that she left to start over. Overwhelmed by all the changes in her life. However, her family don't believe that she would abandon everything she'd worked for and they don't believe she wouldn't at least let them know she was okay. Others have speculated that Kiera was simply a victim of a local gang or was the target of a crime of opportunity. While Kiera's case is still open, the investigation has slowed down considerably in the last year. Connor and Sheila Dwyer the sudden vanishing of a married couple from County Cork in 1991 has baffled both amateur detectives and local authorities alike. The bizarre disappearance occurred almost 30 years ago, but still there are no answers in this extremely cold case. Connor and Sheila Dwyer lived and worked in Fermoy County Cork in 1991. Connor, 63 had previously been employed as a plumber and handyman, but had most recently taken up work as a chauffeur for a wealthy German businessman named Fritz Wolf, who was holidaying in a nearby village. According to reports, Connor was having the time of his life in this occupation, as it allowed him to drive the flashy cars he had been dreaming of owning since he was just a child. Their neighborhood was not the most affluent, meaning neighbors didn't miss the shiny Rolls Royce that sometimes sat at the front of their house. It wasn't subtle and it stuck out like a sore thumb. While Connor was in his element with his new career path, Sheila, 61, was a homemaker. The couple's two grown children had since left the nest, both choosing to move to England. But Sheila kept herself busy throughout the day with cooking, errand running, and other household tasks. Friends and neighbors noted that she was always well-dressed and made a consistent effort with her appearance. Nothing seemed to miss in the pair's life when they suddenly stopped answering their telephone and vanished one day from their home without a trace. Connor and Sheila were last seen attending a funeral at St. Patrick's Church in Fermoy on April 30, 1991. The church was just 100 meters from the couple's Chapel Hill home and they made it back safely. That evening, Sheila spoke with one of her sisters on the phone. It is unclear when exactly the Dwyers vanished. The last time anyone spoke to the couple was on May 1st, when again, one of Sheila's sisters spoke to her on the phone, but subsequent calls to the residents went unanswered. There are conflicting reports about when the couple were reported missing. Some sources say May 19th, while others say May 22nd. Either way, it's clear there is a gap of around three weeks, in which the pair's movements are not accounted for. It's unclear why nobody reported the couple missing, not friends, nor family, nor neighbors during that time. One of the Dwyer's children, also named Connor, said he had last spoken to his parents on St. Patrick's Day, March 17th. He reported that nothing had seen amiss with the couple. The Dwyer's were finally reported missing when one of Sheila's sisters went to the home after failing to contact either half of the couple. She was met with a silent empty house and she alerted the local authorities. When the garter arrived on the scene, they immediately began to investigate. Nothing seemed out of place and nothing was missing. There were no signs of a struggle or forced entry. The couple's personal belongings, including clothes and passports, were found in the home. A biscuit tin kept in the house still contained around 2,100 euros. The only thing the garter couldn't locate was the couple themselves. And their car, a white Toyota, with the registration plate 5797ZT. In the years since their disappearance, no trace of the Dwyers has ever been found. Their bank accounts have never been accessed and their car has never been located. Since the River Blackwater runs through the town, authorities conducted an exhaustive search of the water and the surrounding countryside, all to no avail. Shortly after their vanishing, Interpol was alerted and ferry records were combed through for any sign of either the couple's car or their presence on any of the ships. But once again, this lead was a dead end and no sign of the Dwyers was found. Although there have been no confirmed sightings of the couple since 1991, several witnesses stepped forward in the years following their disappearance, claiming to have seen them alive and well. 
One local woman believed she had seen the pair in their car, stopped at a set of traffic lights in Fermoy, just shortly after the couple were thought to have vanished. There have also been different sightings in the cities of Dublin and Waterford. In 1993, the case was featured on an episode of Crime Call, the Irish equivalent to UK's Crime Watch program. After seeing the show, a woman reported seeing the couple at Laudes Airport in France in June of 1991. She said that the man appeared suspicious because he wore a long trench coat and kept a constant careful eye on his wife while he went to grab a newspaper. She thought it seemed like he was worried the woman would talk to somebody else while she sat and waited for his return. She said when the man returned to his wife, he said something to her and they both left. The witness claimed that the couple both had Irish accents. At the time, she was unaware of the missing pair. And thus didn't report the sighting sooner. She added that she was later interviewed by authorities with one of Sheila's sisters and that apparently the clothing she described matched the clothing that was missing from the house, presumably the clothing the couple had worn when they went missing as no other garments were reported as gone from the home. Another interesting sighting came that same year in 1993 when a witness recalled seeing the pair at a Munich airport. This conversation was particularly interesting to the garter considering before his disappearance, Connor had been working for a German businessman. However, neither the Bavarian Police Department nor Interpol could confirm this sighting. Another unclear detail in the couple's case was whether or not Connor was working for Fritz Wolf at the time of his vanishing or if he had stopped, perhaps because Wolf had returned to Germany. If Connor was still under Wolf's employment when he went missing, why had Wolf not reported his driver as missing? In the year 2000, new information led authorities to search a lime quarry about 45 minutes from Fermoy. However, this search turned up no new leads. One of the most curious aspects of the case is that it is shrouded in rumor and hearsay. Reddit forum users have noticed their family's reluctance to discuss the case, while accusations range from Connor orchestrating a murder-suicide plot to the 63-year-old being involved accidentally in a drug-running business. One particularly interesting whisper involves Connor disappearing for several years back in the 1980s. It is unclear where this rumor started, and it is unknown why he left or returned if the rumor is true. It's also been speculated that the couple took their own lives together in a suicide pact. This theory arose because Connor's brother mentioned that he had suffered from depression before. If Connor really did disappear in the prior decade, then perhaps his mental health struggles played a role in that too. One theory in the case postulates that the couple's vanishing is linked to the disappearance of William Billy Fennessy, who vanished from Fermoy almost exactly a year prior. William was of a similar age and his car was also missing. However, his body and car were both pulled from the River Blackwater in 2013. The theory that appears to be the most likely is that the couple suffered the same tragic fate as William Fennessy, but their vehicle and bodies have simply not yet been found. The couple's more outspoken son, Connor, claimed in a 2008 interview that his parents had no enemies and were not disliked. They were friendly and respectable and well-known in the community. He also noted his belief that they were still alive, but added, I wonder what the hell was going through their minds. There's a void of information. It's very bizarre and inexplicable. It is a living nightmare. There have been very few updates in the couple's case in recent years. There have never been any suspects or theories announced to the public and authorities have stated their belief that the couple's vehicle is likely the key to the case. Mary Boyle if you're an Irish viewer, you are likely familiar with the name Mary Boyle. The missing six-year-old's case is not only controversial, but also extremely tragic. Mary has been dubbed Ireland's Madeline McCann in recent years. Her vanishing is the longest-running missing child case in the Republic of Ireland. Born June 14, 1970. Mary Boyle was a vibrant and talkative little girl. She had an older brother, Patty, and a twin sister, Anne. Mary Ann and were reportedly inseparable, with Mary being the boldest of the two. Although originally born in Birmingham, the young girl moved with her family to Balashannon in Ireland in the early 70s. Mary was last seen at around 3.30 p.m. on March 18, 1977. She was playing with her cousins and siblings near her grandparents' rural farm, which the family had been visiting since St. Patrick's Day on the 17th. 
While playing, the six-year-old saw her uncle heading off with a ladder, which she was returning to a neighbor, and she decided to tag along. However, her journey was cut short when the two came across a large bog. Defeated, Mary turned back to return home. The trip should have lasted no more than five minutes. But the little girl never returned home. Mary's uncle stayed at the neighbor's farm for around 30 minutes, engaged in conversation with the occupants. Meanwhile, her family began to search for the six-year-old, scouring the local area and questioning passers-by. In one article by the Irish Independent newspaper, a fisherman reported seeing Mary being snatched by somebody in a red Volkswagen Beetle. However, this witness apparently clarified his statement on a BBC podcast by stating that he had not seen Mary being taken, but he had seen a suspicious red vehicle in the area at the time. When the garter arrived on the scene, they sprung into action, draining bogs in the area in an attempt to uncover her body. The lake behind Mary's grandparents' house was also drained and authorities filmed a reconstruction of her last known movements using her twin sister and a famous Irish country music star named Margot O'Donnell, who was a friend and distant relative of the family, caught wind of the case and funded searches for Mary on the surrounding hillside by selling new music. Searches have been regularly carried out since 1977, but so far, Mary has never been located. Mary's case is extremely controversial. There are unclear details, conflicting reports, and allegations of corruption surrounding it. It is widely believed that a politician stops law enforcement from detaining and questioning a prime suspect in the case. Thus, it has never been solved. One of the loudest voices supporting this belief is a right-wing journalist named Gemma O'Doherty. O'Doherty is a determined journalist who has not only written about the case in publications, but has also created a documentary about the disappearance called Mary Boyle. The Untold Truth The documentary is available to watch on YouTube, although O'Doherty herself was banned from the platform in 2019 for repeatedly violating YouTube's hate speech policies. O'Doherty is largely considered to be a controversial character herself. She's known to be a racist anti-vaxxer with anti-LGBTQ plus beliefs. Reportedly, her news-gathering ethics have also been called into question in the past. That said, her theory pertaining to Mary's case can't be entirely discredited as there are several pieces of evidence supporting corruption and a cover-up. In her documentary, Gemma suggests the theory that Mary was sexually abused and murdered. Her sister Anne and several other relatives have publicly claimed that they know what happened to the six-year-old and they know who the culprit is. And supports O'Doherty's theory. And says the perpetrator is still alive and still living in the country. In the documentary, and can be heard saying, I believe Mary had a secret. I believe Mary had to be killed to stop her telling. However, this claim has not come without a cost and no longer speaks to her mother and the Boyle family is largely divided as a result of their split beliefs. In 2016, the twins' mother, also called and called the appeals, the most ridiculous carry-on I have ever seen in my life. Margot O'Donnell recalled asking the politician, the one who allegedly stopped the interview with the prime suspect, if he had done such a thing. The politician denied any involvement and branded Margot a barefaced liar. The initial suspect was released without charge and does not appear to have ever been named in any newspaper reports. According to O'Donnell, the politician was not only friends with the suspect but also had a good relationship with the superintendent who was in charge of the case. A detective sergeant named Aidan Murray has also confirmed that he was close to a confession from the prime suspect when a superior officer ordered him to rein it in. Murray added that he had also witnessed the call between the politician and law enforcement, which instructed the garter not to question the suspect further. The politician who intervened in the Mary Boyle case is alleged to have been a man named Sean McKenneth, who passed away in 2017. When still alive, McKenneth was supposedly surrounded by accusations of sexual abuse and grooming. Mary's uncle, Jerry Gallagher, reportedly worked for him. Many believe that Jerry Gallagher is responsible for the disappearance of his niece. And Boyle has never outright accused her uncle, but armchair detectives have put two and two together. According to Odo Hardy's documentary, Gallagher gave conflicting statements over the years and apparently didn't even admit that Mary had been with him when she initially went missing. 
The documentary is not without its criticisms, even from those who starred in it, but it does give viewers some compelling information. Even if no politicians were involved, it appears that law enforcement's efforts to find the murderer of a six-year-old girl were severely lacking. Other suspects in Mary's case are few and far between. In 2014, a man named Brian McCann, who had been jailed for two years for several sex offenses just a few years before, was pulled in for questioning but later released without charge. He has publicly denied any involvement with the six-year-old's disappearance. Another man who was considered a suspect for a time was the infamous Scottish serial killer and pedophile Robert Black. He was thought to have been involved when authorities discovered that he was a cross-border truck driver who as part of his job often visited that same county from which Mary vanished. He was even known to have been in the area at the time of her disappearance. One witness even claimed they heard crying coming from the back of his van, which was parked outside of a pub in the village of Anagri. However, he has since been dismissed as a suspect. Mary's case, according to the Garter, is not cold, although the family have little faith in law enforcement and don't believe they will ever see justice. In 2018, a silent protest was held outside the coroner's office in the town of Stranola. Participants aimed to force the coroner to hold an inquest into Mary's disappearance, allowing key witnesses to be interviewed on the public record for the first time. Protesters also handed in a petition with 10,000 signatures demanding an inquest be held. This does not appear to have been successful, however. There are claims that Mary's mother has continually denied any inquests into the six-year-old's disappearance. There are many theories in Mary's case. Most believe that Jerry Gallagher was involved and that O'Doherty's cover-up theory is truthful. Others have pointed to the suspicious actions of Mary's mother and suggested that the parents helped cover up the crime in some way. It's also been postulated that the six-year-old was involved in an accident but nobody wanted to admit it or that perhaps Mary never even left the cottage at all, suggesting she was killed in the home. Mary's father passed away in a fishing accident in 2005. The rest of the family remained split by their opinions on what really happened to the little girl. To this day, her case is still unsolved. And there you have the facts. Beth McKen was an energetic, innocent, and heartwarming young girl. Her unfulfilled childhood and endless potential to grow into an inspiring, creative, and world-impacting woman was cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing on May 3, 2007, leaving all who knew her in person and eventually both the entire United Kingdom and surrounding countries grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the disappearance of Madeleine McCann and the mystery at Little Britain in the village of Pride Lewis, Portugal. Madeleine McCann was born on May 12, 2003 in Leicester, England to parents Kate and Jerry McCann. Kate and Jerry were Roman Catholic physicians and a loving pair meeting in Glasgow in 1993 before marrying five years later in 1998 it would be another half decade before the couple bore a child and introduced Madeline to the world two years before having two more children a set of twins Sean and Emily in 2005. Madeline, along with her younger brother and sister, formed a beautiful kinship with their parents and often traveled around the world on vacations and seeing the sights are in Europe. Both Kate and Jerry would later describe the mechanic plan as the perfect nuclear family of five. Madeline's parents described her as vivacious, a lively young girl and lovingly extroverted. She was a ringleader amongst her infant siblings and fellow toddlers, never missing an opportunity to extend impressive social skills and communicating with those who gave her attention. Madeline's openness usually developed into an uncanny humor that's only an innocent, bright child Kakunja. They said her ability to express herself, unveil her imagination, and communicate with her feelings was second to none. Madeline's burst of energy inspired her to enact role-playing and forming miniature stories with playmates, creating a strong bond as she related so easily to other chill however. The never-ending drive in the little ray of sunshine often wore out her parents constantly needing attention from the people in the room she occupied. 
In fact, Madeline's youth was accompanied by hardships just as much as the positive bits. Kate and Jerry claimed the first six months of Madeline's life were very difficult and that she had suffered from college. She cried practically for 18 hours a day. We had to permanently carry her around. Colleague is an infamous illness found in babies, causing severe abdominal pain and intestinal blockage. The cries then transformed into screams after Kate gave birth to twins. Again, her parents explained that Madeline would run up and down in the background while Kate attended to the newborn babies. This hysteric hyperactivity would later prove a trait found in all the McKen siblings, but never broke up the unconditional happiness felt between the family members. Friends and family of the McKen offered similar sentiments as well. They all witnessed firsthand Madeline's brilliance and social inclinations while also noticing her protective nature towards her two siblings, often mothering them when their parents were out. In fact, some associates of the Macons believe Madeline and her siblings' camaraderie stopped at the presence of secluded strangers or an unknown group of people. However, because she knew how to engage even in foreign situations, relatives believed Madeline could get along with anyone if she was given the time. These careful observations and infinite effects of joy surrounded Madeline all the way up until a vacation she and her family took to pry the Lucy in the Algarve region of Portugal settling in a well-known tourist town for British holiday makers. The Micken family quickly linked up with fellow doctors and assorted friends also vacationing in the area starting on Saturday, April the 28th, 2007. Kate, Jerry, Madeline and the twin youngsters were having a wonderful time on one of their many frequent trips and all the good times seemed destined for picture books. That is until the night of May the 3rd, 2007, barely a week before Madeline's fourth birthday. Kate and Jerry went out for dinner only to return to their flat and find missing their resilient and radiant daughter because sometime between 8.30 and 10 p.m., Madeline McKen disappeared without a trace, leading a void in the hearts of not just his family, but in the hearts of people around the world. Launching an exhaustive search that would soon evolve into the most discussed missing persons tragedy of the 21st century. On April the 28th, 2007, the McKin family travels to Pride Deluge, Portugal for a seven-day spring break getaway. The 1,000-person village is nicknamed Little Britain for the vast amount of UK travelers staying in the area. The Mackins retreat to 5A Rua Drive, Agostino de Silva, a flat owned by a retired teacher from Liverpool. Throughout the next week, the McKin family dines with seven other friends and five fellow children. The adults known as the top of seven consisted of Fiona and David Payne, Diane Webster, James Tanner, Russell O'Brien, and Matthew and Rachel Oldfield. All of the men worked together over the years and their respective families all got along wonderfully. On day six of the vacation, May the 3rd, 2007, Madeline and her twin siblings hang out to the Ocean Club's Kids Club at the Prairie de Luz Resort, while her parents go for a walk at around 10 a.m. During breakfast, Madeline asks her parents, Why didn't you come when Sean and I cried last night? An hour and a half later at 12.30 p.m., Kate and Jerry pick their children up from the kids' club and have back at 5 before setting off for the swimming pool. At 2.29 p.m. that afternoon, Kate McKen snaps the last photograph taken of her daughter. At the resort poolside with the sun shining and Madeline smiling per usual between 3.30 and 5.30 p.m. Madeline and her siblings return to the kids' club and eat dinner together. At approximately 6 p.m., Kate brings her children back to 5 while Jerry attends a tennis lesson elsewhere at the resort. Around 6.30 p.m., Jerry sends Tapa's 7 but David Payne back to the apartments to check on his wife and three children. When the tennis lesson ends at 7 p.m., Jerry returns to 5 and helps Kate put Madeline, Sean, and Emily to bed. Their bedroom is fastened next to the front door at the flat. And as a single window overlooking the car park and public street, the shutter is closed before the children fall asleep. Between 7.30 p.m. and 8.30 p.m., Kate and Jerry clean up from the day's activities and share a bottle of wine together before heading off to dinner. At around 8.35 p.m., 
The McKinn couple is the first of the friend group to arrive at the resort Tapas restaurant, located just 160 feet away from the A5 apartment. They reserve a table overlooking their living quarters where the top of five could be seen. The resort staff leave a message in writing at the reservation is specific because the families have children sleeping back at the complex. Twenty minutes pass by and a few more members of the top of seven arrive at the restaurant at 8.55 p.m. As the friends begin their orders, Matt Old. Field quickly returns to the apartment complex to check on his flat and alert the Payne family that everyone else is waiting on them. Ten minutes later at 9.05 p.m., Jerry heads back to 5A to check on his own children. He walks through the unlocked back patio doors to avoid using the locked front door and potentially awakening the seeping youngsters like they had been doing all week. Everything inside seems normal until he finds the children's bedroom door to be open about 45 degrees instead of just a jar. Suspicious, Jerry peers his head in, but finds all three siblings fast asleep and accounted for. He closes the door bag at 5 degrees, uses the toilet, and departs. This is the last confirmed sighting of Madla McCann. A few minutes pass by and Jerry stops to speak with a friend and fellow holiday maker Jeremy Wilkins at 9.08 p.m. on the road near the Tapas restaurant. Throughout the next hour or so, members of the Tapas 7 swap turns going back to their apartment complex and checking in on their respective children. At 9.10 p.m., Jane Tanner walks up the road to her flat and passes by Jerry and Jeremy Wilkins without their notice. On her way, she sees a man walking across the path ahead of her, carrying a sleeping young girl wearing pink pajamas in his arms. It's a peculiar sight but not uncommon to a resort with many families. Tana finds her daughter safe in her room and returns to the restaurant. A little later at 9.30 p.m., Kate gets up to check in on Fiva once more, but fellow Tapa 7 friend Oldfield offers to do it instead while he keeps an eye on his own family. Kate agrees and Matt travels to the McCann's apartment. Inside, he finds the door to the children's room opened again, but to him, it means nothing. Instead, he pops his head in the door quickly and sees the twins sleeping in their respective cribs. From this vantage point, he doesn't explicitly notice Madeline and leaves the quiet building assuming all is perfectly normal. A half hour passes by and Kate makes another five a checker south at 10 p.m. However, when she goes to push the children's door open, a draft of wind from inside the room slams the door shut. Kate enters with force and finds the window open and the shutter pulled up. The twins sleep soundly in their beds, but Madeline is nowhere to be found. Minutes later, Rachel Oldfield rushes to find fellow Tapa's seven-member Jane Tanner in her apartment and relays the news of missing Madeline. Jane immediately calls back to her sighting and explains, Oh my God, I saw a man carrying a girl. Matthew Oldfield then travels to the 24-hour reception desk at the bottom of the resort's hill to alert them of the disappearance. An alarm is raised and police are called at 10.15 p.m. Fifteen minutes pass before the local authorities arrive at Flat 5A, along with the police. Around 60 staff members and assorted guests search the grounds for Madeline. An exhaustive hunt that lasts until 4.30 the following morning at 11.10 p.m., Special investigators from the police judiciary ventured to the scene and discovered the sliding glass door that was found open by Kate McKenna as a lock. Both Kate and Jerry are unsure if they actually locked it at the beginning of the vacation. While resort employees unveil that the cleaning staff will often open the sliding windows to air out department interiors. The special investigators are unable to confirm if this was the case. By the early morning hours of 2 a.m., Patrol dogs are called in to keep an eye on the search efforts six hours later at 8 a.m., for rescue dogs arrive to sniff the area around the resort and attempt to catch trail of Madeline at 5 a.m. beyond. At 10 a.m., the local police finally set up roadblocks to monitor traffic both coming and leaving the resort and surrounding routes. Over the next 24 hours, up to 20 strangers outside of the main investigators and family members interact with the Five apartment later proving to taint much of the evidence and cause headaches for future forensic work. 
In the coming days, police began interviewing anyone and everyone associated with the resort or simply living in the area. Kate and Jerry rented out another nearby home to stay close to the investigation. Throughout the next 11 to 12 years, a combination of Portuguese Police Scotland Yard, Macon Associates, private investigators, and public empathizers have yet to find one solid trace of Madeline McCann. Certainly. Here's the revised script with corrected grammar. After faulty DNA findings and tabloid exploitation, the case has entered a sphere unlike any missing person's tragedy before. Madeline's disappearance changed the world to the point that many UK citizens and people close to the case define society as either before Madeline vanished or after Madeline vanished. Regardless of cultural impact or giving value to the importance of one case over another, one thing is certain. Until she is found, we must continue evaluating all theories, evidence, and tips until Madeline comes home or her fate is justifiably understood, and there are some major case points we need to examine. From the beginning of the search for Madeline McCann, investigators knew that pinpointing suspects, or what the Portuguese classified as aguidos would be daunting, as the location of the disappearance happened to be a busy hotspot for tourists, residents, and complete strangers who came and went each day. Specifically, the late spring vacation season was ripe with faces both old and fresh, meaning the early list of aguidos would stretch to impossible numbers. Anyone could be guilty while everybody was innocent at the same time. They dashed at the catch-22. Luckily for the police, Jane Tanner recalled her peculiar incident from the evening of May the 3rd sooner rather than later. Her sighting of a man carrying a young girl away from the McKenna apartment complex would become the focal point of the early investigation and remain as the major case point in the eyes of the public following for almost six years. However, its importance isn't grounded by what it unveiled to authorities. Rather, grounded by what it distracted authorities from considering. It took up more than a decade of the precious moments spent looking for Madeline. Dubbed the Tana sighting, Jane Tanner's testimony gave the first possible timeline of Madeline's suspected abduction. As mentioned previously, Jane had traveled from the Tapas restaurant back to her flat to check in on her children at around 9.10 p.m. She walked down the road, passed by Jerry McCann as he spoke with a fellow vacationer, and headed into the complex. Both Jerry and the second man would later say they couldn't remember seeing Jane walk by them that evening and due to the confines of the narrow street, police initially believed Jane to be fabricating the entire ordeal, yet Jane stuck by her following claims and highlighted that while Jerry and the vacation didn't confirm her movements, they couldn't deny them either. A few minutes of walking later, and Jane witnesses an older man with what appears to be a toddler in his arms. She says he was crossing the junction of Francisco Gentle Martins and Rua Drive, Augusto da Silva, moving east and away from the corner of 5A, where the Macon children's bedroom was located. His direction was first determined as suspicious as he was supposedly walking in the direction of Robert Murat's residence, a 34-year-old Portuguese suspect early on in the hunt. Jane Tanner described the unidentified man as a white male standing at about 5 feet 7 inches with dark hair and complexion that would indicate European or Mediterranean descent. He seemed to be 35 to 40 years old from a distance, wearing beige pants, a dark jacket, and the demeanor of a local. The girl he was carrying was wearing pink and floral pajamas cuffed at the legs, much like Madeline was wearing. These descriptions were curiously withheld from media until May the 25th, three weeks after the disappearance. A few months later, in October 2007, Money from a fund set up by the McKinn family was used for a forensic artist to recreate a simulated sketching of the Tanner sighting. The result is now one of the most famous images associated with Madeline's case. Sadly, the intensive search for the man from the Tanner sighting turned out to be a six-year red herring chase. In October of 2013, Scotland Yard finally identified a British holiday maker who matched the T.S. description and fully corroborated with police. He explained that he was indeed carrying his own daughter after picking her up from the Ocean Club and heading back to their flat. To prove his innocence, 
the identified man dressed up in the same clothes as was mentioned in a TS report, and visually to the specific profile detailed in the sketch. The man was also able to provide the clothes his daughter was wearing the night of the sighting, as well, and once again the alibi cleared when the unveiled pajamas bore a likeness to Madeline's Yorset but was, in fact, different. What frustrated authorities the most with the Italian sighting wasn't the lack of information it provided, but rather the time it took away from other potential pieces of evidence, an eyewitness testimony that would later prove vital. First off, the Tana sighting led investigators to believe the main abduction took place between 9 and 9.15 p.m., which they based their impending reports on. However, after learning the town of sighting had little to no connection, they had to retrace their steps and recalibrate more than half a decade's worth of thinking. Thus, Scotland Yard turned their attention to another eerily similar sighting from the night of May 3, 2007. This incident reported by Irish holiday makers, Martin and Mary Smith. The Smiths claimed that they saw a man carrying another child at about 10 p.m. in a location which was about 460 meters away from the Macons in 5A. The Smith sighting man was walking away from the Ocean Club and nearing the beach at Rua 25 Diabro. The Smiths described the new figure as a male standing at about 5 feet 8 inches with shorter brown hair and a slim build. He seemed to be in his mid-thirties from the Smiths' vantage point and wore bay shorts. Much like how Jane Tanner described the man in her sighting as not a tourist. The Smiths offered the same testament. Going as far as to say, the man seemed uncomfortable carrying the child. The girl he was carrying had blonde hair, pale skin, bare feet, and was wearing lighter colored pajamas, again like what Madeline was wearing. EFIT images were initially created back in 2008 when the testimony was first recorded, but the entire sightseeing was muddied when Martin Smith thought Jerry McCann fit the profile of the Smith sighting man. Oakley International private investigators were quick to strike down the possibility since Jerry had been confirmed at the Tapas restaurant at 10 p.m., but the rumored confusion created sensitive press about the Smith's side. It wasn't until October of 2013 that it reverted law enforcement's attention and reset the timeline to the abduction happening just before the Smith's site. While the Tana sighting ended in lost time, it's sadly a common thread found in many missing persons cases and criminal investigations overall. Where a lead seems revolutionary, yet can take years only to find it with a dead end. Regardless of results, the sightings are also proof of just how vast the spider web of possibilities is with Madeline's disappearance. And the preceding searches and how one simple memory or visual can spawn thousands of theories that send everyone involved spinning in circles. One of the early theories cultivated by Portuguese investigators actually considered Kate and Jerry McConaughey's suspects. The base of the claim was built by supposed DNA evidence found by cadaver dogs inside the family's rental car after Madeline's disappearance, as well as DNA matching hers discovered behind the couch in the 5A apartment. This led police to draft a 10-page conclusionary report including wild ideas regarding a likely murder of Madeline, a cover-up fake abduction that involved the top of seven as conspirators to mislead police and even a claim that the number of suitcases each member of the party brought to Portugal was suspicious in nature. Realistically, none of the theories made sense or had conclusive evidence to back them up. The DNA found in the car and in the flat were tested using DNA methods and it was stated in the forensic reports that despite the matches to Madeline's DNA, the sample sizes were simply too small to consider credible. Not to mention, the hours upon hours spent questioning the Wacken couple and their friends who all cooperated fully and dedicated their testimony to truth and hope for Madeline's fate. In fact, almost as soon as the disappearance was reported, Kate set up a project called Madeline's Fund, leaving no stone unturned limited which immediately caught fire across the UK and raised thousands of dollars to help hire private investigators and allocate resources directly to spreading awareness. Unfortunately, the early consideration of the McKen couple as a Guidos fostered a tabloid firestorm that ended with lawsuits, deformation hearings, 
an unnecessary backlash that has turned a lot of the conversation around Madeline's disappearance to gossip and unsubstantiated finger-pointing. Because Kate and Jerry were soon relieved of suspicion after these reports were filed. They have since been 100% cleared by the current authority. There is no reason to consider their involvement as a realistic or plausible hypothesis and will not be considered any further. Another early theory proposed by investigators was a burglary gone wrong. According to records, the time between January and May of 2007 saw an unnatural rise in burglaries and burglary attempts in the area, including two around the McCann's apartment in the 17 days leading up to their vacation. These reports suggested that a burglary went into place the evening of May the 3rd of which Madeline interrupted after climbing out of bed and exiting a bedroom hence why the doors opened further than Gary had left it. Then the burglar would have taken Madeline as a precaution leaving through the bedroom window since it faced the street outside the resort. In April of 2017, Scotland Yard announced a foiled burglary attempt was no longer under consideration. After they had interviewed potential thieves in the area and other potential suspects, but found no evidence. While the theory wasn't completely ruled out, their focus would turn to other ideas. A third position by investigators but quickly disregarded. Is that Madeline wandered out of a bedroom on her own accord and was taken by a passerby or fell into a construction zone nearby. These musings were first discounted by Kate McKen who reminded police that Madeline would have had to open the patio doors on her own, close the blinds behind her. Remember to shut the door again, operate the childproof gate at the top of the stairs, and finally open and close the gate at the street level. All while being a three-year-old toddler and unseen by resort members. It's also regarded unlikely that Madeline climbed out of the bedroom window under her own power as well. The most agreed-upon theory by private investigators and law enforcement is one of abduction, including pre-planned abduction. This theory stems from the bevy of suspects seen around the 5A apartment complex in the days leading up to Madeline's disappearance, looking suspicious or acting out of a normal manner, possibly carrying out reconnaissance for a bigger operation. For years, police have been tracking down these suspicious men, as well as known pedophiles, bogus charity collectors, and criminals who were later convicted of similar crimes and could be placed in or around the area in May of 2007. In the end, the unbelievable amount of press and scrutiny this case has received from various experts and media channels all across the world have bloated websites, editorials, and blog posts with both theories and conspiracies. Some crime scene experts who have taken a dive into Madeline's disappearance have stated that they do not believe the scene backs up an abduction hypothesis and believe Madeline was murdered. Other followers call the police work in the case as nothing more than hunches, reminding us that the treatment of the 5A apartment was so improperly handled that no evidence or forensic examination could be carried out and tainted. At least 20 different people went in and out of the room on May the 3rd. 2007 before it was taped off. Killer testing wasn't carried out for months, allowing new vacationers to rent the apartment from the resort before it was locked down by police again. This coincided with constant bickering back and forth between Portuguese police and investigators from the UK, where tensions were rather high after numerous law enforcement entities made their way to Portugal and interrupted the search. To top it all off, the tabloid interference and age of media bombardment against the McCann skewed public perception and hindered authorities to go about their duties without incredible tension waiting around the corner. With the vast amount of possibilities, no theory can accurately be concluded as the answer. Authorities have released tens of thousands of documents and translated almost every single one of them. They've investigated over 8,000 claimed sightings of Madeline and had counted in 2015, that they took almost 1,400 statements, collected over 1,000 exhibits, investigated 650 sex offenders and 60 persons of interest, not counting the next four years of research. As of today, Madeline's case has received 11,750,000 euros in funding. Yet there are still so many unknowns associated with Madeline's vanishing, and until they are resolved, and police release every document, report, 
and case file, we must wait for new leads to surface while doing our part in spreading awareness. But let's take a look at some of the suspects. One way we want to help divulge information is by sharing a list of suspects still wanted in the hunt for clues leading to Madeline due to the sensitivity attributed to the case and the unfortunate loss of time in the early years of the investigation. We won't be drawing our own hypothetical conclusion. Instead, highlighting critical police sketchings and efforts of people either acting suspiciously around the time of Madeline's disappearance, or who have raised red flags in a variety of situations around Europe. Firstly, we have an unidentified woman whose profile was released on August 2009. The woman in question was seen near Port Olympic Marina in Barcelona, Spain, on May 7, 2007, just 72 hours after Madeline disappeared. She appeared agitated, was nicely dressed but kept pacing up and down the street by Ray de la Gamba restaurant and bar. Two passing British men noticed the disturbed woman and decided to approach her. When one of the men, who wishes to remain anonymous, asked if everything was okay, the woman asked, Are you here to deliver my new daughter? No other details are known, but the British witnesses say that after their conversation, the woman had a colorful argument in Spanish with a local inside the neighboring pub. Again, no other details have surfaced except that the witness described the woman's accent to be of Australian qualities and appeared as an Australian Victoria Beckham lookalike. Next, we have an unidentified man who was spotted three different times by a fellow holidaymaker, Gail Cooper, who was in Praia de Luz on vacation from England. The first time she saw the man, he was walking in his lonesome under a heavy rainstorm along an abandoned beach on April the 20th, 2007. Later the same day, the man with olive skin and shoulder-length hair knocked on Gail's door and pretended to be a charity collector, a popular con around the resort area during the spring of 2007. Two days later, on April the 22nd, Gail saw the man for a final time, hanging around a children's event sponsored by the Mark Warner Resort. Gail was called back to Portugal in 2008 to work with the detectives on recreating the man's likeness through two sketches. At first, the man was thought to be the same man whom James Tanner witnessed carrying a small child away from the apartments back on May the 3rd. But when he was cleared, the long-haired man was confirmed as a separate individual. In 2010, private investigators showed clips they had filmed of a man from inland Portugal doing labor outside of a white truck. Gail watched these unreleased clips and found that despite the lack of a mustache and lighter hair color, the recorded man was the same man from the Praia de Luz beaches in April of 2007. Similar stories compared to the previous men have been updated with police sketches as well. Again, other witnesses claim to have interacted with fake charity workers in the area around the time Madeline vanished and gave descriptions that were translated to pictures of these two men. Two other fair-haired men were also described to have been hanging near the McKinn flat around May the 3rd and were thought to be of Scandinavian, German, or Dutch heritage. Another pair of EFIT profiles were uncovered in old Portuguese police reports and subsequently unveiled to the public, again representing suspicious men appearing in the area. In addition, the Smith sighting evidence also resulted in two different EFIT creations for a man seen carrying a small child at 10 p.m. on May the 3rd. Another mysterious encounter resulted in police sketches occurred three days after Madeline's disappearance but wasn't announced to the McKinn family or the public for over a year until the eyewitness was approached by Mirror magazine. Annette, then 41 years old, made a call to Dutch police when she thought Madeline and an older Dutch couple walked in at an Amsterdam shop on May the 6th, 2007. According to Annette, the man was between 35 and 40 years old, with a mustache, dark skin, and spoke Portuguese. The woman he was with was a little older, maybe in her 40s, with brown hair and spoke French. Accompanying them was a little girl. The following are direct quotes from Annette in Mirror Magazine who said, I'll never forget the girl. She had her hair in a ponytail, huge green-brown eyes, a pale face which showed no emotion. I didn't like the man. He didn't look like a nice person. I work in a party shop, 
so most people smile when they come in to buy things. But he didn't smile back at me when I smiled at him. He had no sparkle in his eyes. He was short with me and seemed angry. I got the feeling. He didn't want me to interfere with him and the others. The woman was also peculiar acting stressed and uncomfortable, Annette said. She tried to smile at me, but it was out of obligation, not from the heart. The whole way they reacted made a big impression on me. The man spoke in Portuguese. I know because I have Brazilian friends. The woman spoke in French while the little girl spoke English. It didn't seem like a real family. When the girl spoke, she allegedly mentioned, My name is Maddie, followed by she is not my mummy. They took me from my holiday. Anna later recalls thinking, The woman told me she was in a station wagon, a larger car. Maybe they were going on a long journey because this woman spoke French. I immediately thought that they would go to Belgium or France. This would later connect the dots with early police theories that feared Madeleine had been taken by a Belgian pedophile gang, followed by three separate sightings of Madeleine lookalikes in Belgium after May the 6th. Because Anna wasn't 100% certain that there were any criminal acts associated with the encounter, she didn't report it to the police right away until a month later when she saw the Madeleine McKinn case discussed on television. The Dutch police created EFITS and sent it along to Portuguese police on June the 18th, 2007, but the info never made it to the McKinn family. So when and heard that over a year later in the summer of 2008, the McKinn family had no knowledge of her testimony, she took it upon herself to connect with the current British law enforcement covering the case and cycled back through her memories. Thus, the sketches of the French woman and Portuguese mustached man were created, leaving Anna fearful her testimony came too late and the potential lead lost in translation. Probably the most disturbing police sketch is that of the pockmarked man. The man in question was seen multiple times hanging around the McKinn apartment by three separate witnesses, all in the time frame of the McCann's vacation. The first witness, a 12-year-old local girl who saw the pockmarked man outside the balcony of 5A at 8.15 a.m. on April 30th, in her own words, the girl said, I was walking to the school bus stop. I go this way to school every day. I saw a man on the small path behind the block. He seemed to be looking at the balcony of the ground floor apartment. My grandparents used to live in that department, so I always look at it as I pass by. A few days later, on May the 2nd, the day before Madeline disappeared, the girl saw the same man looking at the McKinn flat again around lunchtime. The second witness was a female British tourist who recorded the following. I saw a man acting suspiciously on two occasions. The first time I saw him, I was walking along the road with my daughter. I grabbed my daughter's hand and pulled her towards me because, for some reason, the man unnerved me. The next time I saw him, he was standing on the opposite side of the apartment. He was watching it. I would describe him as very ugly with pitted skin and a large nose. The third witness, a man from Cheshire, was walking with his partner at 11.30 a.m. along the road by 5 a, but couldn't remember if it was May the 2nd or 3rd. He said, I saw a man standing next to a wall on the opposite side of the road was a white van. I paid particular attention to him because he appeared to be focused on watching the apartment block. As I walked past him, I looked at him, and for a split second, we had eye contact. But then he just carried on staring at the apartment. All three sightings have incredibly creepy backstories to them, and truly send shivers down the spine when inspecting the man's sketch. If Madeline's abduction was pre-planned, finding the figure who was seen multiple times by multiple people, analyzing the McCann's living quarters could lead to valuable information. If the man in these testimonies or any of the presented drawings rings a bell at all, please speak up and say something. Even though it's been almost 12 years since that tragic night in Praia de Luz, we must remain diligent in our pursuit of Madeline's captor or anyone who might be involved. We'd love to make detailed videos about a single possible suspect, but there are so many involved it pains us to leave out smaller players who could still have a big role. We recommend everyone who's interested in the case to research the other persons of interest, 
and we have provided some useful links in the description. Madeline wasn't just a ray of sunshine, but also a child constantly absorbing knowledge with the potential to grow into a gifted and gracious human being. She was stripped of that opportunity, but the chance to rekindle her spirit isn't gone forever. There are still zero signs or clues provided that would lead investigators to think she is deceased, and until we find evidence that suggests otherwise, we must act as if her heart still beats somewhere out in the world. Whether it's in Europe or elsewhere, Madeline's will to survive does not go away with time past. Her energetic soul and compassionate heart deserve our attention, our grace, and our utmost determination. The little girl who loved to communicate, display her affection for family, and find the beauty in all that entered her youthful, innocent life needs our help. And we'd be defying our duty as fellow dreamers of the human race if we didn't pour our faith into the efforts of finding Madeline McCann or direct evidence that leads to someone who knows of her fate. Rico Omar Harris, known to the world of basketball, and all who followed his career as simply Rico, was an extroverted athletic, one-time world-renowned basketball prodigy. His energetic, entertaining skill set followed by a courageous battle against addiction and apparent recovery was cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing in October of 2014, leaving all who knew him, from college basketball fans in Los Angeles to the Harlem Globetrotters, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence that drowned us all in doubt. Rico Harris was born on May the 19th, 1977, to parents Henry Harris and Margaret Fernandez in Los Angeles, California. After moving to Oregon for a little while to account for Henry's new job, the Harris family quickly bonded with one another but moved back to Los Angeles soon after to raise three additional children. During their younger years, the Harris siblings were subjected to violent and abusive tendencies at the hands of their father. Rico specifically was a frequent target of Henry's rage, taking the brunt of his abuse, despite desperately seeking out his approval as he grew into a teenager. Henry's collision course eventually drove Margaret away, and she took her children with her to Alhambra, California. Rico, the eldest brother, took it upon himself to help support the family, and while Margaret would work full-time, he watched over his siblings. While his parents urged him to use his big body frame in sports, Rico decided to pursue basketball at age 15. To improve his chances of finding success, he enrolled in Hollywood High School, a headache of a drive all the way from Alhambra. However, these aspirations only lasted a year before Rico realized he was born to play basketball and used his father's address to attend Temple City High School. By the time he was 16 years old, Rico was already 6 feet 8 inches tall and 250 pounds, a colossal young man. It didn't take long for him to take control of the basketball court, dominating his opponents and entertaining the crowds with his explosive style of play. He transformed a once dormant high school club into a powerhouse program, drawing in college scouts as he reflected the style of Magic Johnson and broke through double-team defenses. Off the court, he was an introverted adolescent without much academic prowess. Until he met a girlfriend whose family helped him achieve higher grades in school. This helped Rico find even more success in basketball, and during his senior season, he averaged 28 points, 15 rebounds, and was compared to top basketball recruits in the Western United States, such as Jason Terry and Paul Pierce. Sadly, because Rico failed to receive high marks on the SAT, his scholarship offers from top-flight universities such as UCLA were rescinded. Thus, Rico ended up at Arizona State to take classes before regaining eligibility to play basketball. For the first time in his life, Rico was away from friends and his close-knit family, and it caused struggles in his studies and his social life. In March of 1996, he was briefly accused of unlawful imprisonment along with two other teammates. But the charges were dropped, and Rico was told he had to sit out a second sports season to clean up his act. Refusing to sacrifice additional precious time, Rico transferred to Los Angeles City College. He was able to join the basketball team and immediately let his presence be known. 
He guided the LACC club to a state title and won most valuable player. But by his second year, Rico found himself in academic decline and trending towards an unhealthy lifestyle, constantly consuming alcohol despite still performing at a high level on the basketball court. When he lost connection to his former girlfriend and acknowledged his deteriorating emotional health, Rico shut down his recruitment from other colleges, fearing they only wanted his skills rather than his personal development, and declared for the NBA draft. Once again, this plan went up in flames when Rico kept pushing off special events to showcase his skills in order to remain close to home. As a byproduct, he withdrew his name from draft consideration, declining various college offers to play Division I college ball, and transferred to Cal State Northridge. Many thought it was a poor choice for Rico's future career, and the doubters were unfortunately correct. Over the summer between semesters, Rico attempted to reconcile with his estranged father Henry, but was swiftly rejected. Caught in the purgatory of social and emotional negligence, Rico continued to lose focus and lost interest from the NBA during his only lackluster season at CCUN. As per NCA eligibility, Rico turned to semi-professional basketball to keep his NBA dream alive. He played in San Diego, St. Louis, and other pickup teams before deciding to join the Harlem Globetrotters, a comedic exhibition basketball team. In a tragic twist, Rico found himself in a scuffle in South LA one month into the Globetrotters gig, in which he was hit in the back of his head by a baseball bat. While he survived, Rico suffered from balance issues and headaches thereafter, effectively ending his basketball career. After moving back to Alhambra with his mother and siblings, Rico entered a seven-year stretch of battling addiction that started with alcohol and exploded into heroin, meth, and cocaine. In fact, all of the Harris siblings were suffering from some version of substance abuse, and then Mother Margaret did everything she could to help them with their demons. After Rico turned 30 years old in 2007, he finally sought true help and entered rehab. The program lasted longer than normal, but in the end, Rico recovered from his addiction. In 2012, he met Jennifer Song, a Seattle insurance broker, and the two entered a romantic relationship. Throughout the next couple of years, Jennifer and Rico became very close. Rico eventually moved to Seattle permanently and started planning a life with Jennifer as a married couple. The two talked about having children and setting up a happy future. Rico even lined up a job interview as a property appraiser, an incredible opportunity considering all he had to overcome. However, before Rico could make the final transformation, he had to go back home to Alhambra one more time, to find closure with his family. He arrived on October the 9th, 2014, and had dinner with his brother, gifting him a new cell phone. Rico then visited his mother, engaging in a one-on-one -on -one private conversation. Whatever resulted in the exchange is unknown, but it's believed to have been against Rico's wishes. Rico left for Seattle again just after midnight and stopped in Lodi, California for gas. He drove all night and in the morning called Jennifer to let her know he was going up into the mountains to rest. It was the final point of contact anyone made with Rico Harris, and he soon disappeared into the North Sacramento wilderness. In early September of 2014, Rico and his girlfriend, Jennifer, enjoyed their intimate, hopeful relationship with one another and began to think about the future together. However, Jennifer noticed something off with Rico, who acted abnormally and lost his sense of organization. After she persisted in questioning him, Rico revealed he lapsed the previous summer of 2014 with alcohol consumption. While it hadn't turned back into a habit, the return to an old threw Jennifer off balance. Rico's relapse is confirmed by longtime friend David Lara, who had rekindled their friendship around the same time. Later in September, despite the earlier friction, Rico and Jennifer settled on taking their relationship a step further and move in together in Seattle, Washington. It's seen as a monumental endeavor for Rico, who previously struggled, went away from his hometown of Los Angeles, and close-knit family. The couple engaged in intense conversations about marriage, 
having children, and exploring true love, yet Rico still felt insecure about the new surroundings. It took him almost a month to unpack, as Rico felt awkward making himself at home in a living space that wasn't his own. Jennifer later says it was Rico's sensitive underlying will to provide for loved ones that fed the insecurity and not lingering second thoughts or laziness. Within the first week of October, things changed for the better. Rico secured a job interview for a position as a property appraiser at a local real estate company. The new opportunity sparked joy and encouragement, and Rico finally unpacked his belongings in Jennifer's house, a signal he was ready for change and was there to stay in Seattle. The happy eyes shifted unexpectedly on October the 8th. 2014, when Rico told Jennifer he was going out later in the day to explore, a bit strange compared to Rico's usual activity. Yet Jennifer didn't think twice about it and kissed her fiancé goodbye. But when Jennifer calls Rico later in the evening of October the 8th, Rico informs her that he's on his way to Los Angeles to visit with his family. Rico explains that he wants closure from the dark past of his childhood and to create trust with his mother again regarding their relationship and his future. Jennifer, while taken aback, understands his well meetings and supports his quick decision. Jennifer remembers Rico sounding excited to move on, his head seemingly in the right space. Rico arrives in Alhambra the next day on October the 9th. His mother, Margaret, notes his excitement about the recent changes and ultimately about his flourishing life. However, Margaret also suspects Rico to have been drinking more under the influence of a substance. In the evening of October the 9th, Rico leaves his mother's house and has dinner with one of his younger brothers. He buys his brother a new cell phone, and the two reminisce of old times. After the brothers' rekindling, Rico heads back to Margaret's house in Alhambra to engage in a private conversation and again seek the closure he desires from a tattered childhood. The conversation does not last long, and Margaret later claims she felt Rico hadn't taken from the conversation what he had hoped for in terms of emotional revelation. Not long after the clock strikes midnight on Friday, October the 10th, Rico decides to head back to Seattle rather than spending the night like his mother expected. In order to have extra prep time for his interview, he takes a few extra personal belongings from his mother's home and hits the road. At around 1 o'clock, Rico calls his mother again to explain his rash decision. Margaret recalls her son saying something along the lines of, I have these things that I need to do. Right after talking to his mother, Rico then calls Jennifer once again, surprising her with the premature return home. The couple talks for three to four hours, throughout which Jennifer encourages Rico to find a motel and sleep, considering he had been awake for 40 plus hours. Rico finally comes around but expresses the desire to drive up to the nearby mountains for a quick nap. Jennifer suggests an alternative, reminding him he'd have no cell service at high altitude, and the dark winding roads would be dangerous in the thick of night. The two end their phone call with Rico still set on driving. At 8 a.m. on October the 10th, Rico receives a second call from Jennifer after she slept for a few hours. Rico informs her that he's getting gas at a station near Sacramento in a town called Lodi, California. He sounds incredibly tired from his end of the phone. A an hour or so later, Rico was contacted again, this time by his mother, wondering about his progress. Rico finally admits to his exhaustion and claims he's going to find somewhere to rest and eat throughout the morning. Both Jennifer and Margaret make multiple calls to Rico to check in on his resting plans but Rico never picks up. After a few unsuccessful tries, Jennifer sends him a text. At 10.44 a.m., Rico finally responds to Jennifer's text and says he is doing well but gives little details. This is the last official contact anyone makes with Rico Harris. As morning shifts to the afternoon, Jennifer tries to let Rico's rest time go uninterrupted. Yet her anxieties get the best of her, and she calls him anyway still getting no response. Jennifer tells herself he must still be in the mountainous region of California, and the cell service is playing a role. Between 7 and 8 p.m., 
Jennifer officially falls under the silence of Rico and calls Margaret to worry. Margaret, on the other hand, is calm and guesses Rico is just operating on his own will, not uncommon to his personality. Sometime before midnight, Rico records himself singing along to in his parked car but appears to be doing so unintentionally. He also throws around various CDs from the passenger compartment as well. These video clips are later found to be timestamped on the evening of October the 10th, confirming he was alive and functioning at that time. At 11.15, Rico's cell phone turns off. Whether it was by Rico himself or due to battery failure is unknown. The weekend of October 11th and 12th goes by, and Rico never returned any calls or returns to Seattle. Yet Jennifer and Margaret hold off on reporting it, remembering he won't escape to San Diego for a few hours without notice and give him a couple of days to reappear. On Monday, October the 13th, a Yolo County deputy sheriff makes a routine check of an isolated rest area parking lot at Rumsey Canyon in Ramsey, California, along California State Route 16. He finds a black Nissan Maxima off to the side in the dirt lot with no nearby passengers but lets it be. The following day on Tuesday, October the 14th, the same Yolo County Sheriff returns to his route and finds the Nissan in the same spot in the parking lot. He runs the plate in his database and discovers it belongs to Rico Harris, his address still linked in Alhambra. The Yolo County Sheriff's Office calls Margaret to inform her they found the car but no person, and she then calls Jennifer, trying to make sense of what both women described as a surreal dream. Margaret officially files a missing persons report with the Alhambra Police Department, and law enforcement opens an investigation. Over the next week or so, they put together a vast network of searches and rescue personnel. Helicopters with thermographic cameras fly over the surrounding areas. All-terrain vehicles are commissioned for the mountainous search zone, and cadaver dogs are deployed to pick up any lingering scent of Rico. Overall, the crews covered a 5-mile radius of the parking lot and a 27-mile stretch of Ramsey Canyon, along Route 16, but find little clues besides unidentified footprints in the dirt alongside the road. Using cell phone data, police interview residents of nearby locals and receive a few reassuring sightings dated back to Sunday, October 12th, but nothing concrete surfaces. On October the 19th, Investigators receive another tip about the sighting of a large man walking along Route 16, and subsequent shoe prints are found in the dirt once again. However, the location of the previous eyewitness testimony and footprints compared to the October 19th clues lead police to conclude Rico had left the site of his car at Ramsey Canyon, walked along the Cache Creek, and then returned to the original spot for unknown reasons. This revelation would provide the strongest foundation for later theories. A few days later, on October the 22nd, the search is pulled back and slowly dwindles down. In mid-November of 2014, divers return to deeper sections of the surrounding bodies of water to record more searches, but again, find nothing of use or suspicion. Since the mid-October mystery, Nobody has found credible evidence to lead police to answers or spark reasonable theories outside of speculation. Currently, we are only left with what was found in those few weeks of investigating, making the entire ordeal murky with dead ends and puzzle pieces without a home. In the case of the disappearance of Rico Harris, most of the tangible clues were discovered in the first week or so of searches. But none was more perplexing than the backpack and cell phone recovered on the guardrail along Route 16 near Cache Creek. After police assessed cell phone records from the provider company, data pings led them to the Redwood Valley area in Northern California, about 70 miles northwest from where Rico's vehicle was originally located. To cover all their bases, authorities called as many residents as they could in the surrounding communities, leaving messages on voicemails asking for tips. It didn't take long for the scheme to produce results when lead investigator Dean Island received a call from a Redwood Valley man who claimed to have found items belonging to Rico. Police immediately responded to the tip and learned that the Redwood man indeed had a black backpack owned by Rico Harris. Inside the backpack were jumper cables and his cell phone. The man explained that he, his wife, 
and their grandchild were driving along Route 16 when the young boy alerted his grandparents that the stray backpack was on the curb of the highway and alarmingly out of place amid the surroundings. The man pulled over, and the trio shouted into the wilderness to hopefully make contact with the bag's owner. When they found nobody down the creek, the Redwood family checked the bag for ID. All they found were the cables and phone, so they took it with them in hopes to charge it and contact someone. Law enforcement quickly assumed the backpack to be Rico's. Not only was the bag like a purse, according to Jennifer, who recognized the parcel instantly, but was also found only 1,500 feet from a sighting reported by a passerby earlier in the week, someone who had seen a large African-American man standing along the guardrail on Route 16. These inclinations were confirmed when the officers assessed the cell phone and combed through its information. Pulled from the phone would later prove to be crucial visual evidence in creating the timeline of Rico's last known actions. In his media gallery, Rico had videos of himself singing along to music in his car, seemingly ignorant of the fact that he was recording himself. Along with absent-minded singing, Rico was also seen throwing around CDs in the cabin, ripping up random papers, and playing with the sunroof controls. These clips were saved in the evening hours of October the 10th, meaning Rico was alive that night and probably showcased the reason why the vehicle was out of gas and had a dead battery. The fact that Rico had been tossing items around in the car also helped explain why the car had originally appeared ransacked when investigators towed it into the station. Most importantly, however, the cell phone videos gave authorities a better idea about the state of mind Rico was in around the time he'd last made contact with his family. The fact that Rico recently relapsed with drug use was thought to have consumed alcohol while in Alhambra, engaged in difficult emotionally draining conversations with his family, and was awake for an estimated 50 hours straight would certainly lead to a fragile psyche. This combined with Rico's indecisive demeanor, and lifetimes worth of personal struggles could have tripped him into madness. Or at least extreme exhaustion. Without a doubt, the backpack, cell phone, and overall major case point show Rico was in trouble. And if not from a third party, then at least from his own beaten bat itself. The first and most popular theory discussed in the case of Rico Harris developed into a confusing speculative story of foul play. The hypothesis originated with the Yolo County Sheriff's Department after the Nissan was found abandoned and seemingly plundered. Besides the mess of papers, CDs, and bottles in the back seat, investigators also know Rico's wallet was left behind, still full of its contents, except for a discovery credit card. On the exterior, the car wasn't parked in any of the marked parking slots and had both no gas and the dead battery. Police calculated that after filling up with gas in Lodi, California, Rico took a wrong turn and headed northeast on Route 16. When he found the Cache Creek Park in Rumsey Con, he pulled off to rest, released pent-up energy, and was eventually embattled with a third party to explain the defects of the car. Investigators guessed the gas must have been siphoned. This theory would also explain why a 6'8", 300-pound man could so easily slip through the cracks outside of a few potential sightings. Men of that size typically don't go away unnoticed unless another person or persons drive them away, or something far sinister. The foul play musings became much more obscure when Rico's backpack and footprints were discovered. Because the cell phone videos show Rico sitting in an idle car on October 10th, it's possible he ran out of gas and dues the battery from extended periods of running both the engine and the audio system. Normal cars can run through 1.5 gallons of gas per hour just in the idle position. So it's in the realm of possibility that Rico let his car run through the night to the 10th and into the weekend of October the 11th and 12th. It would also help explain why the interior of the car was wrecked and why jumper cables were in Rico's possession. He was probably looking for someone to help jump his battery, meaning the footprints along Route 16 suggested Rico walked along the highway to flag down passers-by. There was also zero DNA findings to corroborate third-party interference, or the presence of a stranger. So while Rico certainly didn't encounter foul play while in his car at Cache Creek, 
investigators still theorize he met with trouble after hitchhiking along Route 16. They believe while walking and talking to anyone who would pull over to assist him, Rico was taken advantage of by someone or somebody with criminal intentions. It's very likely Rico was not in the right frame of mind that weekend, and if he came across as exhausted or groggy, his could easily persuade him to leave his backpack behind and get in the vehicle. It's a bit confusing as to why someone would risk dealing with a man who is almost guaranteed to have a physical advantage, not to mention no money on their person, but it's also worth remembering Rico relapsed shortly before his disappearance. And if he found someone who promised him drugs or other substances, how likely would he have been persuaded? Who well, this figure could be ranges from a potential killer to a drug dealer to someone desperate for a man of Rico's stature. Unfortunately, there are hardly any leads or threats associated with the foul play theory besides combing through people with criminal backgrounds in the area. Due to the vast population of Northern California and the Sacramento area, the possibilities are borderline infinite. Another theory considered by many is that Rico was wounded and taken by a wild animal or large predator. Northern California has its fair share of wildlife, including combative creatures such as rattlesnakes, mountain lions, and black bears. A rattlesnake would certainly be able to bite and poison an unsuspecting human. But if Rico was in fact bit by a snake, his body would have been picked up by the air helicopters or numerous search parties. Black bears, while imposing animals, are in fact quite docile and do not interact with humans very often, let alone a large man the size of somebody like Rico. The only animal that makes sense is a mountain lion, yet it would take a considerably strong cougar or pack of cougars to kill Rico and then take his body into a dwelling cave or habitat hidden from humans. The search found no signs of struggle in the dusty expanse of Ramsey Canyon. And again, the mere size of Rico probably deterred wild animals from approaching. And if he did die somewhere in the wilderness, his body would not have tokayed into the ground and avoided visibility due to the timeline of the disappearance and impending manhunt. The third theory associated with Rico involved around a planned escape and manufactured disappearance. This conspiracy points to Rico's history with indecision and probable disappointment with the closure he sought when returning to Alhambra. Supporters of the story suggest that Rico realized in his return home, he no longer wanted the life he hoped for in Seattle, and thought best to vanish without a trace and escape somewhere new. The theory points to the new cell phone Rico bought for his brother highlighting the Rico could have bought a second phone that he used for his getaway, and that his brother helped him along the way. After the conversation with his mother went south, Rico decided to leave unnoticed using his scheduled interview as an excuse. On the way to Sacramento, Rico slowly broke off contact his mother and girlfriend and veered off course from Interstate 5 to Seattle and drove east to Cache Creek. When he arrived he recorded himself to appear distressed and potentially even stage a kidnapping or robbery. After the car finally ran out of gas and electricity, Rico walked off with his backpack and old phone appearing to need help with the jumper cables. Instead, when Rico flagged down a car to hitchhike, he left the bag and cell phone find to create a diversion. Some goes far to say whoever picked him up was in on his plan and a link to Rico's stage disappearance and his new life. In the end, this theory is rife with inconsistencies. Rico had been adamant to all he knew that the opportunities in Seattle were incredibly encouraging. He had recently become a resident of Washington State, constantly talked about marriage and fatherhood, and truly settled in with Jennifer. Police also tracked the missing Discovery credit card found missing from Rico's wallet, and the account was never assessed or operated at any time following October the 10th. Meaning that if Rico escaped, the funds he would most certainly need to execute such a scheme came elsewhere and not from personal wealth. Taking into consideration the skill and resourcefulness needed to pull off such a feat, the improbability of faking a mental collapse seen in the selfie videos, and coincidental contrast of Rico's recent attitudes towards life. The idea that Rico stays at his appearance and escape thereafter is highly implausible before we divulge our hypothesis of Rico's mysterious disappearance, 
we want to make known our conclusions presented in Cold Case Detective. Our purely logical speculation based on evidence, circumstance, and factual subtext. We are only privy to the same information presented in each video, and we do not attempt to promise certain or an expert guarantee on the findings we reach in the closing. We simply observe research and report. In this case, we believe Rico continued to relapse into substance abuse as a result of personal torment and extreme exhaustion. Fanned himself alone and free of scrutiny out in the wild after making a wrong turn on his journey and wandered into unknown territory where he most likely died hidden by the natural elements. All of his life, Rico gout with the absence of a caring nurturing father, despite the physical and verbal abuse he sustained in his youth. Rico sought his father's approval and internalized his love for basketball. After he and his siblings moved in with their mother, Rico never quite broke off the relationship he had with Henry Harris. When Rico's basketball career fizzled out and he turned to drugs and alcohol, Rico swelled the bubbling tension from a rough childhood. To make matters more complicated, Rico ran into his own father in jail after an arrest for public intoxication. These humiliations and unresolved conflicts took a psychological toll on Rico, leaving him with signs of undiagnosed depression, anxiety, and possibly bipolar disorder revealed by Jennifer after he disappeared. Taking a history of mental troubles into consideration, a relapse into substance use, and family or shortcomings would have put Rico in a very dark place on his drive back to Seattle after his attempts to tie knots on his past fell short and failure created the wounds in his heart and mind to irreversible sizes. Thus, after staying awake for more than two consecutive days, the emotional instability caught up to Rico and he ventured from the planned course. On his drive up north, he probably took a wrong turn that took him through the mountains of northern Sacramento and into Ramsey Canyon. Between the stop for gas and Lodi and parking in the lower side of Cache Creek Park, Rico found an outlet for drugs and alcohol and picked him up. Hard drugs are notoriously distributed throughout Sacramento and the surrounding regions, so it wouldn't be too tricky for a former addict to navigate and purchase. After he parked, Rico either consumed the drugs he had collected or experienced the side effects in full force. It's plausible he had taken either crack or methamphetamine throughout the trip anyways, stimulants that explain how he could stay awake and alert for so long. The drug reasoning comes from a vital clue found in the Nissan Shima after police towed the vehicle into evidence. Under the glove compartment below the passenger seat, investigate a discovery bundle a plastic wrap used specifically for drugs. Now the bindling question was empty and contained no residue or drug paraphernalia but hinted at a recent inclination towards substance use. There were also two bottles of alcohol found, one empty, and the other half full. Also thought to be consumed by Rico. After the car ran out of power and gas, Rico wandered off from the lower side along the guardrail on the highway. He set his backpack and cell phone on the curb and walked down to the actual creek for a drink and cooled down where enormous footprints were found days later by the search teams. After spending time by the water, Rico found an easier way up the hill back to the road, a different place than where he'd left his belongings. While continuing to plot along Route 16, Rico was able to hitchhike and find a way into a small town or establishment where he could clean up and find something to eat. A couple vagrants in Clear Lake, California have said they recognized Rico buying drugs in the area once, but didn't have any details or further information regarding their testimony. The last part of this theory is quite cloudy. What Rico engages with throughout the next week is a complete mystery. But he avoids eyewitnesses and returns to the lower side in Ramsey Canyon, where his car was parked on October the 19th. It was this night when someone reported sighting a large African-American male walking in that direction, and police later confirmed it with more footprints in the immediate area. Rico was probably dropped off so that he could return to his car. But when he found it was hauled away, either went back to the vehicle that dropped him off or decided to stick the new friend Freedom and march into the woods. What happened afterwards is the true meat of the mystery. As mentioned previously, 
Rico was hard to miss, and his profile didn't allow for much invisibility. Maybe he tripped into a sinkhole, or that camouflaged him from search and rescue. Maybe he took his own life in a deep part of the rugged forest regardless of details. Rico Harris was dealing with issues none of us can father more ignore. Whether it was a lack of sleep, a depressive episode triggered from recent events or a combination of anxiety and drug use. Rico wasn't in his normal state of mind. His reckless activity in the cell phone videos proves just as much and unfortunately casts a heavy shadow of unpredictable behavior that stemmed afterwards. The Harris family and Rico's close friends have often talked about Rico's history with drugs and addiction to a stigmatized character and undermine the public perception of the case. We want to be perfectly clear. Rico's struggles with substances does not take away from the compassionate and caring person he was. He deserves just as much attention as any missing person and is not any more of a bad guy than you are. Addiction sting will be damned. Addiction is a disease of mind and body and can create turmoil of both physical and emotional health. Those who struggle with addiction must battle not only their own sickness, but the constant degradation of society and those who categorize addictive persons as failures to the consequences of their actions. Rico Harris deserves to be found. He was a warrior, a courageous spirit that endured so much pain throughout his life. He finally found the light at the end of the tunnel the dawn breaking from a treacherous night. He loved his family, he loved his friends, and he loved making a difference in people's lives. Outside of his athletic giftedness, Rico was a kind soul. He would have gone unthinkable distances to help those in need, so it's only fitting we do the same in his favor. Let not his legacy be Harlem Globetrotter to drug it to missing person. Let his legacy be of caretaker to a fighter, to a found and fostering father, his ultimate aspiration. Like this video and subscribe our channel. Phoenix Caldon was an endlessly inquiring, spirited, and musically talented young woman. Her dedications to religion and giftedness in the arts were cut short by an unexplainable, untraceable vanishing in December of 2011, leaving all who knew her, both in life and through the world wide web, grasping for answers in a sea of evidence. As a hope to provide more substantial reasoning built upon observable evidence and situational analysis, this is an examination of the disappearance of Colden and the mystery at the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue. Phoenix Colden was born on May the 23rd, 1988, to parents Gloria and Lawrence Colton. After spending some time of her youth in the sunny state of California, Lawrence's job moved the family to the greater St. Louis, Missouri area where they spent the remainder of their time together. The Coldens moved into a residential neighborhood of Spanish Lake a quiet and middle-class suburb where Gloria and Lawrence would commit to raising their bright and beloved daughter. From an early age, Phoenix was raised in a world surrounded by church and Christian values. Her parents kept a close eye on her demeanor and social interactions, making sure she kept true to kindness, compassion, and respect. This was coupled by a strong attraction to music and instrumentation as Phoenix developed a profound talent for the musical arts. Every Saturday morning, she would practice on the family's piano, quickly falling in love with the craft and finding a means in which to express herself. Phoenix's time at home increased when she entered middle school after her parents decided that she was better off in homeschool rather than attend a public institution. While it continued to shelter Phoenix from interacting with a different world than what she was accustomed to, she never batted an eye. Her enthusiasm for learning, knowledge, and participating in academics was second to none, and she excelled in all of her studies. When she wasn't doing coursework or making music, Phoenix was advancing her fencing skills, attending rigorous practices that led her to ultimate championing of the sport, as she retained the local junior fencing title. From 2007 to 2011, Phoenix attended the University of Missouri-St. Louis, moving into an apartment with a friend. Around this time, Phoenix started displaying a different side of her personality, struggling to reconcile with her sheltered upbringing and strict lifestyle. 
She began arguing with her parents more frequently and participated in risky behavior. While it was a contrast to the normal phoenix that her parents knew, either Gloria nor Lawrence figured it to be any more than the pains of entering adulthood. That is until May of 2011 when Phoenix returned home at the demand of her mother, and tensions skyrocketed. Throughout the next months, Phoenix's abnormal behavior hit an all-time high when she broke off her closest friendship with her longtime neighbor, Akira, after an argument forced Phoenix to admit she was uneasy about something in her life. Something that would not be cracked by either Akira or the Colden family. As the warmth of summer turned to the chills of winter, Phoenix's crisis worsened. Her parents and few friends described her as a different person. No longer was she the well-balanced, soulful woman with a great sense of humor, strong in her faith, naive about the world, and ambitious to live up to the world's expectations. Instead, she was a shell of her former self. Both Gloria and Lawrence Colton felt that their daughter's own soul was on the brink of returning. But sadly, never knew for sure when, on a silence in the afternoon, Phoenix walked out of a Spanish lake home for the final time, not to be seen or heard from again, leaving nothing behind but odds and ends in her car, abandoned in the middle of the road on St. Clair Avenue. Sometime in the year 2005, Phoenix called on Meets Akira in the Spanish Lake neighborhood, and the two quickly become good friends. Because Phoenix is homeschooled, she waits by the bus stop each day for when Akira arrives home after public school. Phoenix isn't allowed to go over to the Hogan household much, so her relationship with Akira and her mother Martini consists of talking on the front porch. The Hogan see Phoenix's parents as a little too strict as a result. In the fall of 2007, Phoenix enrolls in the University of Missouri, St. Louis, eager to explore lifestyles differing from the religious-tempered world she knew growing up. Around the time of starting college classes, Phoenix meets a guy named Michael B. They soon enter a romantic relationship despite her parents' disapproval of him. Over the next few years, Phoenix and Michael B. hide most of their intimacy from the Colton family. They move into an apartment together with the help of Phoenix's mother, Gloria, who signs the lease under the impression that her daughter is moving in with a female friend. Gloria proceeds to visit the flat multiple times in the duration Phoenix lives there, and not once sees a clue that alerts her a man is living there. At some point in 2010, Phoenix informs her childhood friend, Akira, back at home, that she wants to leave Michael B., but isn't sure about how to go about it. Instead, she starts meeting other men. One of the men is another person named Michael, referred to as Cell Phone Mike. Phoenix heats up a second romantic relationship with Cell Phone Mike behind the back of Michael B. Around the same time, Phoenix purchases an alternative cell phone plan behind the back of her parents. She uses the burner phone to communicate with Cell Phone Mike and her phone from the family plan to upkeep her normal life with Gloria, Lawrence, and Michael B. In the months leading up to spring of 2011, Phoenix secretly steals money from the Colton family safe in their home. The money in question is in the form of savings bonds under Gloria Colon's name. Phoenix discreetly cashes these bonds at various points, pulling in around $2,500. What happens to this money isn't known. When May of 2011 arrives, Phoenix moves back in with her parents at their request after they decide paying for the apartment is financially difficult and their house is technically closer than her apartment is to the university. The situation begins to unravel in the summer of 2011, when Phoenix has a mental breakdown in front of her friend Akira. Phoenix claims she has the feeling that she's being followed, specifically saying that an anonymous person or people are watching her and the Colden family in the park one day. It is a paranoid discussion with unsettling foreshadowing in which Phoenix shares she has a feeling that something is after her and something is going to happen. On November the 15th of 2011, Phoenix records a selfie video on her phone while she sits in her car, expressing the extreme frustration she has with herself and the emotional crisis she's in. Phoenix appears distressed and on the verge of tears, saying things like she wishes she could start over. She also recites an altered version of the Serenity Prayer. 
During Thanksgiving break later in the month, Phoenix meets with an old friend from her teenage years, Tim Baker. She confides in him that, despite telling people she's at the university, she never actually enrolled in classes that semester. Given the secret from her family, Tim knows about the second burner phone and realizes Phoenix is living a double life and feels like she's hiding something from him too. Not long afterward, sometime at the end of November or early December, Phoenix has another fiery incident with Akira. This time, she argues with her best friend about petty little issues regarding their friendship and Michael B. It escalates when Phoenix reveals she carries a 10-inch dagger knife stored in the driver's side door of her car. Akira thinks Phoenix is just trying to intimidate her and claims she's done nothing wrong. After Phoenix hints that she's going somewhere to get away, Akira claims this mental state is totally abnormal for Phoenix and, like Tim Baker, feels that her friend is hiding something. Throughout the first weeks of December, Phoenix makes an increasing number of phone calls to her original boyfriend, Michael B., via her family plan's cell phone. On December the 17th, she engages in 10 separate phone conversations, ending with a 116-minute call unknown as to what it is about and if it played a role in the mind-numbing mystery about to unfold. At 9.34 a.m. on December the 18th, 2011, Phoenix makes a two-minute phone call to a friend Rosie again using a family plan and cell phone. Five minutes later, at 9.41 a.m., Phoenix makes a six-minute call to Michael B. on the same cell phone as before. At 11 a.m., Phoenix attends the morning service with her mother, Gloria, at their usual church. Phoenix performs in the handbell choir and appears like her normal self to the congregation's pastor, Mark Miller. After church, Phoenix makes the last recorded cell on her family plan cell phone to Michael B., a call that only lasts one minute with unknown details. Not much time passes before Phoenix and Gloria run an errand to the grocery store around 2 p.m. On the way home to Spanish Lake, Phoenix turns to Gloria and says, Mom, we need to get back to the way we used to be. Gloria responds asking, What do you mean, Phoenix? And Phoenix says, we just need to be more what we used to be like. Gloria figures, the old version of her daughter is coming back. Five minutes past 3 p.m. later that afternoon, Phoenix walks past her father silent yet determined. She hops into a black 1998 Chevy Blazer and backs out of the driveway. This is the last known sighting of Phoenix called on. About two and a half hours later, at 5.27 p.m., East St. Louis Police Officer Perry received a call about an abandoned car in the middle of the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue. Officer Perry arrives on the scene in 8 minutes at 9.35 p.m. and finds an empty black Chevrolet Blazer sitting in the middle of the road near a stop sign. Assuming the vehicle ran out of gas, Officer Perry checks out the interior. He finds the engines not running, the lights are off, bearing no purse or phone inside no sign of struggle, and resting there like any normal parked car would. He runs the license plates to see if it comes up as a stolen car in the database, but produces no hits that he calls a local towing company and runs the VIN number, confirming that the car was actually from Missouri and probably crossed state lines on a routine drive. Officer Perry enters the car's data into a nationwide car logging system, but the delay in the program causes the vehicle to remain absent from the National and Pine Register. Later in the evening, the car is taken into an Illinois car and truck and pan lot, but the owners of the vehicle are not contacted. The next morning on December the 19th, Glory and Lawrence awake and immediately feel concerned for the daughter who never stays out all night and hasn't been heard from since the previous afternoon. When Gloria calls law enforcement and provides Phoenix's date of birth, the police announce that because Phoenix is a legal adult and has only been gone less than 24 hours, there's no reason to believe she's missing. Gloria persists and informs the officers over the phone that Phoenix was in the 1998 Chevy Blazer, so they run a vehicle check. However, no red flags pop up in the system, despite the impound on the 18th. Over the next couple of weeks, the Golden family urges endlessly for their daughter. They pass out flyers, call nearby hospitals, 
and visit potential hiding spots around town. Gloria even calls multiple local news stations, but none of them air Phoenix's story or help spread awareness. At the end of December, Gloria and Lawrence are informed that one of their vehicles has been impounded at an East St. Louis car lot. They rush across the Mississippi River to find their Chevy Blazer exactly how Officer Perry found it, strewn with odds and ends belonging to Phoenix, but showing no sign of conflict. Gloria feels Phoenix was most certainly not the one who put the car on St. Clair Avenue, while Lawrence gets a sense that Phoenix is ultimately okay. On New Year's Day 2012, Authorities finally pick up the case and declare Phoenix Colton an official missing person a little over a week later on January the 9th. Phoenix's profile is first reported by news outlets and is given special spotlight by Sianria Thomas on January the 25th, who then accidentally shares false information about the state of the Chevy Blazer found on December the 18th, leading viewers to believe Phoenix had been taken from the car with its engine still running and door ajar. In February of 2012, the Colden family hires a private investigator, Steve Foster, to find Phoenix. Along with the local police department, detectives interview all known suspects, including both of the Michael boyfriends who are cleared after interrogation. This would be the only time either boyfriend spoke out about the case, and their transcripts have not been released. Steve Foster also discovers Phoenix's safe-stealing habits which leads to the reveal of Phoenix Colden's second birth certificate under the name of Phoenix Reeves, her mother's maiden name. Over the next couple of years, tens of thousands of tips come in regarding potential sightings of Phoenix. However, none bear any real fruit. These false wolf cries force the Colden family into spending more money they had on PIs to track breadcrumb trails with dead ends leaving the family no choice but to foreclose their home without any tangible hope. The police are unable to find any real clues or physical evidence either. In 2018, the Oxygen Television Network videotapes a separate investigation into the disappearance of Phoenix, with the original investigative reporter, Sean Dry Thomas, and the retired police deputy, Joe Delia. The two combed through the major points in the case and brought a third private investigator, Dean Duke, to run a detailed database analysis of the second birth certificate of Phoenix. The system reveals only four matches in the United States. Three of them are ruled out with complete profiles. However, one sticks out as peculiar. The final Phoenix Reeves's match has no date of birth, no social security number, and no relatives just an address for a house in Anchorage, Alaska, that was active from January to June 2012. Joe and Dean traveled to Alaska and interviewed the neighbors around the address regarding Phoenix. However, none recognize her name from her missing posters. They eventually contact the woman now living in the house that was matched in the database, but the woman says that she's been the sole owner of the place since 2002 and has never seen or heard of Phoenix, neither with the Reeves nor called on surname. While both private investigators are convinced their suspicious profile is that of the real Phoenix called on, they have little else to go on. This is the most recent development of the still frozen solid disappearance. When looking across the entirety of Phoenix's cold case, there are plenty of curious items that could play a major role in the investigation. However, the one piece of evidence that provides the most critical information about Phoenix and her train of thought is the selfie video she recorded on November the 15th, 2011, just shy of one month prior to her vanishing. Unfortunately, the entire video itself has not been released to the public but there are intriguing pieces of direct quotes from Phoenix originating from the video that we've collected for the case file. She starts off by claiming she got ditched by an anonymous person or persons. She follows up by saying, This is ridiculous. I just want to start over. I just feel like I can't start the new me over. A few moments pass, and she continues with, I don't know. I've got to see things for what they are. You know, like instead of thinking about it like that, see things for what they are. Phoenix trails off, saying a few inaudible lines before looking into the camera and reciting a version of the serenity prayer. 
as Lord, please help me accept the things that won't change, and that I won't change the things that I can't change. Further along the video, Phoenix explains that's why I don't like talking to people when I'm mad or whatever because I say stuff that I don't mean. And that's when you learn to hold your composure. I want people to take me seriously. Due to the poor quality of the sound and a few moments where Phoenix was mumbling, it's hard to make out what she's saying. Investigators, Chandra Thomas and Joe Delia, took the video to an audio engineer Brian Kaskin to clean up the audio and decipher the rest of the dialogue. He unveils a portion where Phoenix says, I just want to be happy. I feel so stupid because I let myself go a little bit. I probably would have been in a better situation if I would have stuck with how I used to be. She then proceeds to say, Might as well ride in the back with the cops all up in here. The only person that won't let me down is me. It's unknown how much longer her self-reflection goes on for, but at the end of the video, Phoenix gives one last look into the camera and says bye. Throughout the conversation she has with herself, Phoenix takes plenty of long pauses looking outside the window with a somber, agitated demeanor. Her voice is mellow, soft, and sometimes indistinguishable, yet doesn't come across as calm. Rather, Phoenix sounds as if she's truly worried about the state she's in, consciously struggling with her life in that moment compared to the good-natured lifestyle she lived in prior. It's in these moments that Phoenix herself clarifies she has been a completely different person for better or for worse. Some investigators theorize that Phoenix references a situation that's put her in legal trouble, all that she's hanging around a bad crowd of people are pushing her to want out. Regardless, it's clear Phoenix is struggling with internal conflict, most likely as a result of external pressures. She seemed to rely on no one but herself and her trust in the people around her is obviously deteriorating. Despite the tense atmosphere, however, Phoenix displays her sensitivity and cognitive ability to understand the world. She's attempting to decipher the present by working through the past to hopefully set up a brighter future. Sadly though, the timing of the video and being so close to the disappearance leads all involved to believe her crisis played a major role in the events that mysteriously unfolded. The seven years since Phoenix's cold case has entered the public sphere. The most discussed theory revolves around a possible human trafficking incident. When her disappearance was first reported, a rumor started that the 1998 Chevrolet Blazer driven by Phoenix was discovered on the 900 block of St. Clair Avenue with the engine running, the lights on, and the driver's side door swung open. This version of the story implies that Phoenix was most likely taken out of the car by a second party, and the Chevy was untouched. So who could have kidnapped Phoenix from her vehicle with a sudden force? Well, it just so happens that the 900 block of St. Clair U is positioned right next to the Interstate 70 Highway, branded as the Human Trafficking Highway of America. Not only that, but the area surrounding St. Clair Avenue in East St. Louis is notorious for high levels of crime, gang, and drug-related activity and human trafficking itself. Thus, multiple theories suggest Phoenix was driving in East St. Louis for whatever suspect business she had involved herself in months prior, was targeted by a group of pimps or trafficking operatives, and taken away while at the stop sign and kidnapped into the underground oblivion. Human trafficking survivor Kat Summers, believes the case had Earmark's usual trafficking situations, again, pointing to the state of the car and degraded status of East St. Louis street life. Katie Rhodes, the founder of Healing Action, also felt like Phoenix was most likely pulled into the human trafficking sector. Although she claims Phoenix went into it with a sense of autonomy, Katie explained that pimps are master persuaders, often seducing their victims with the promise of freedom away from the control of parents. That would definitely be the case for Phoenix, who was unhappy living back at home and constantly fighting with her mother. If she was enticed to enter the realms of prostitution in exchange for independence, the pimp would have worked quickly to disorient Phoenix and strip her personal life away. To add fuel to the fire, a woman from the local St. Louis Mothers of Missing Children group claims that in 2017, 
she received a message that included a link and a picture of Phoenix associated with a suspicious escort website. However, when investigators used the link directed them to a fake Facebook page with Phoenix's picture in the profile image, proving to be nothing more than a cruel hoax. This wasn't the only alleged sighting of Phoenix throughout the years though. In March of 2014, an old friend, Kelly Fronaut, reportedly sees Phoenix on a plane going home from Las Vegas. Kelly was seated on her flight during boarding and looked up, catching a glimpse of a woman who appeared to be Phoenix with a group of women staring straight ahead. Kelly called her name to which the woman looked up immediately and asked Kelly if she looked like someone. Kelly responded with the air, You looked like my friend, Phoenix. But this woman kept going, never engaging with Kelly again. She was wearing a zipped-up jacket, nice jewelry, along with women all bearing the same likeness. There were two men in the group with them, pro football player types in the age range of 35 to 40 years old. When they landed in St. Louis, Kelly disembarked and went to Southwest Airlines service counter, saying she saw a missing person on the flight. Police came and combed through the airport but never found the woman thought to be Phoenix or her crew members. Kelly is adamant the woman was Phoenix, raising her confidence a 9 out of 10 during the Oxygen documentary series. There isn't much evidence to refute the possibility that Phoenix disappeared into the human trafficking trade due to the geographic tendencies and history of East St. Louis. Yet it's hard to accept this when the state of the Chevy showed zero signs of struggle. While there were a few odds and ends strewn about the interior of the car, Neither Phoenix's purse nor cell phone was found, unlike the original report stated. The car was abandoned rather than broken into. Unless Phoenix was taken somewhere, and the car was dumped afterward, it's unlikely Phoenix was forced out. This then leads people to believe Phoenix was lured away by someone she knew and murdered. St. Louis, Missouri, is the top five city for violent crime in America and many sleuths point to the boyfriend's situation and the secret nature of a double life outside of Spanish Lake. Michael B. was thoroughly investigated by police and early private detectives, and all parties are convinced he is innocent. While his alibi is unknown, cell phone Mike also makes sense as a suspect. In fact, cell phone Mike actually had a restraining order against him by a separate ex-girlfriend who claimed he was both emotionally and physically violent. Not only this, but during Christmas time of 2011, a week after Phoenix disappeared, the ex-girlfriend states that cell phone Mike took special interest in missing person cases around the area, specifically checking up on the status of Phoenix's case. After authorities reported it official, the ex-girlfriend confronted cell phone Mike about these interests. He said Phoenix had been a customer at the convenience store he worked at, ending with a shouting match in which he asked, why are you worried about someone that's dead? The ex-girlfriend has since declared she is unsure if cell phone Mike was just assuming or knew for sure. Even with the two Michaels cleared by police, a potential murder makes sense when considering all of Phoenix's banknotes, cell phone records, and social media posts came to an abrupt halt the day she vanished. She found that she was being followed for months, leading up to the disappearance and saw darkness on her horizon. The videos she recorded stemmed from a hypothetical sticky situation in which she found herself in trouble involving the police and more than likely a larger and no number of people. Taking it all into account, it makes sense to believe Phoenix's involvement with foes outside of her known social circle led her to illegal doings. Her use of the burner phone was used to navigate these operations, and on December the 18th, she went out to resolve a dispute, ending up a homicide victim at the hands of these anonymous connections. All that being said, police are aware of the second cell phone and haven't reported it as a piece connecting Phoenix to any criminal organization. And while it is possible that because the search is ongoing, law enforcement cannot unveil case details, there's just not enough observable evidence to indicate foul play is involved. There's no blood, no wanted suspects and no DNA in a Chevy Blazer that belongs to anyone other than Phoenix, Gloria, or Lawrence Colton. Nevertheless, 
No theory can be completely ruled out with the bizarre events surrounding Phoenix's vanishing and life as a whole. Living two lives with one being a complete mystery to the people investigators have access to makes extracting leads and following clues a naturally tedious and borderline impossible task. Absorbing all of the information, interviews, and intelligence provided across the board by multiple private investigators, we've concluded that Phoenix Colton up and left Spanish Lake on her own accord, with the help of friends at first, using her pseudonym, Phoenix Reeves and the alternative birth certificate before building a completely new identity and dissolving into society under a new independent position of power. First, let's discuss the abandoned Chevy Blazer, the contents of the car, mostly junk and random garments, leaving no signs of illicit activity or foul play. The collection agency notice regarding Phoenix's unpaid burner phone bill that was discovered makes people question why she would leave it behind so carelessly. But ultimately it wouldn't matter because the phone was still under her name and easily accessible by authorities with investigative abilities. The vehicle itself looked parked and planted from first sight, according to Officer Perry and was most likely used as a decoy maneuver by Phoenix, whoever was helping her leave. Putting the Chevy in East St. Louis would make it seem like something criminal encountered Phoenix and lead searches on a wild goose chase when really it was more than likely camouflage. Once the car was set up, Phoenix most likely had another person drive her away or had another car at the ready. In addition, there's a chance that the Interstate 70 being so close as the trafficking highway of the U.S. was merely a coincidence. In reality, it being a nearby escape route for a quick departure. It's also important to note that East St. Louis is across state lines in Illinois, which would later prove to throw a wrench in the initial search for Phoenix and the vehicle within the automobile database. The second key to the maze is Phoenix's immense critical thinking skills and subtle resourcefulness. Known associates of Phoenix described her as able to make friends with just about anyone, allowing her to adapt to a variety of situations and befriend people with specific sets of services. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Phoenix met friends of friends who could assist with leaving the community and restarting an anonymous life. Now who these suspects might be and to the degree of their craft is unknown, but Phoenix did have a head start with two birth certificates. Using the Phoenix Reeves document for secret plans wouldn't be tracked right away at all and would buy her precious time. She could make purchases, apply for a new social security number, and access any number of resources outside of the Golden Legacy. She was obviously smart enough to hide a second cell phone plan from her family and some of her friends and could have had any number of other phones or communication methods. Remember, she was also intermittently stealing savings bonds from her family safe before moving back home, a potential method of collecting funds for her future departure. When the two private investigators, Joe Delia and Dean Duke discovered the Phoenix Reeves identification address in Anchorage, Alaska, they visited the neighborhood but came away empty-handed. Apparently, the woman who lived on the address under Phoenix Reeves owned the property during the month when Phoenix was linked to it from January to June 2012. However, this woman had never rented it out since purchasing it in 2002 and never saw anyone who looked like Phoenix during her 25-year residency. Yet something isn't right about this anomaly. It just so happens that Phoenix Reeves's profile had zero information points except for an address that was dated just one month after Phoenix disappeared and appeared to be a sensible runaway location. Nobody in Anchorage would recognize Phoenix if she did indeed travel there to hide or plan a further identity transformation and would serve as an excellent middle ground between the United States and starting anew in a foreign place like Japan. It also can't be ruled out that Phoenix paid off the woman who owned the house on record. Either way, we believe there's something very suspicious about Anchorage, Alaska, and concur she was definitely there at some point after her vanishing. In addition, many friends and connections to Phoenix have been less than welcome to reporters, investigators, and anyone looking for answers. While they haven't been necessarily silent, a lot of her friends simply do not want to talk. Human trafficking survivor, Kat Summers, 
believes the case had earmarks usual trafficking situations, again, pointing to the state of the car and degraded status of East St. Louis street life. Katie Rhodes, the founder of Healing Action, also felt like Phoenix was most likely pulled into the human trafficking sector. Although she claims Phoenix went into it with a sense of autonomy, Katie explained that pimps are master persuaders, often seducing their victims with the promise of freedom away from the control of parents. That would definitely be the case for Phoenix, who was unhappy living back at home and constantly fighting with her mother. If she was enticed to enter the realms of prostitution in exchange for independence, the pimp would have worked quickly to disorient Phoenix and strip her personal life away. To add fuel to the fire, a woman from the local St. Louis Mothers of Missing Children group claims that in 2017, she received a message that included a link and a picture of Phoenix associated with a suspicious escort website. However, when investigators used the link directed them to a fake Facebook page with Phoenix's picture in the profile image, proving to be nothing more than a cruel hoax. This wasn't the only alleged sighting of Phoenix throughout the years though. In March of 2014, an old friend, Kelly Fronaut, reportedly sees Phoenix on a plane going home from Las Vegas. Kelly was seated on her flight during boarding and looked up, catching a glimpse of a woman who appeared to be Phoenix with a group of women staring straight ahead. Kelly called her name to which the woman looked up immediately and asked Kelly if she looked like someone. Kelly responded with the air, You looked like my friend, Phoenix. But this woman kept going, never engaging with Kelly again. She was wearing a zipped-up jacket, nice jewelry, along with women all bearing the same likeness. There were two men in the group with them, pro football player types in the age range of 35 to 40 years old. When they landed in St. Louis, Kelly disembarked and went to Southwest Airlines service counter, saying she saw a missing person on the flight. Police came and combed through the airport but never found the woman thought to be Phoenix or her crew members. Kelly is adamant the woman was Phoenix, raising her confidence a 9 out of 10 during the Oxygen documentary series. There isn't much evidence to refute the possibility that Phoenix disappeared into the human trafficking trade due to the geographic tendencies and history of East St. Louis. Yet it's hard to accept this when the state of the Chevy showed zero signs of struggle. While there were a few odds and ends strewn about the interior of the car, either Phoenix's purse nor cell phone was found, unlike the original report stated. The car was abandoned rather than broken into. Unless Phoenix was taken somewhere, and the car was dumped afterward, it's unlikely Phoenix was forced out. This then leads people to believe Phoenix was lured away by someone she knew and murdered. St. Louis, Missouri is the top five city for violent crime in America, and many sleuths point to the boyfriend's situation and the secret nature of a double life outside of Spanish Lake. Michael B. was thoroughly investigated by police and early private detectives, and all parties are convinced he is innocent. While his alibi is unknown, cell phone Mike also makes sense as a suspect. In fact, cell phone Mike actually had a restraining order against him by a separate ex-girlfriend who claimed he was both emotionally and physically violent. Not only this, but during Christmas time of 2011, a week after Phoenix disappeared, the ex-girlfriend states that cell phone Mike took special interest in missing person cases around the area, specifically checking up on the status of Phoenix's case. After authorities reported it official, the ex-girlfriend confronted cell phone Mike about these interests. He said Phoenix had been a customer at the convenience store he worked at, ending with a shouting match in which he asked, Why are you worried about someone that's dead? The ex-girlfriend has since declared she is unsure if cell phone Mike was just assuming or knew for sure. Even with the two Michaels cleared by police, a potential murder makes sense when considering all of Phoenix's banknotes, cell phone records, and social media posts came to an abrupt halt the day she vanished. She found that she was being followed for months, leading up to the disappearance, and saw darkness on her horizon. The videos she recorded stemmed from a hypothetical sticky situation in which she found herself in trouble involving the police and more than likely a larger and no number of people. Taking it all into account, 
It makes sense to believe Phoenix's involvement with foes outside of her known social circle led her to illegal doings. Her use of the burner phone was used to navigate these operations, and on December the 18th, she went out to resolve a dispute, ending up a homicide victim at the hands of these anonymous connections. All that being said, police are aware of the second cell phone and haven't reported it as a piece connecting Phoenix to any criminal organization. And while it is possible that because the search is ongoing, law enforcement cannot unveil case details, there's just not enough observable evidence to indicate foul play is involved. There's no blood, no wanted suspects, and no DNA in a Chevy Blazer that belongs to anyone other than Phoenix, Gloria, or Lawrence Colton. Nevertheless, no theory can be completely ruled out with the bizarre events surrounding Phoenix's vanishing and life as a whole. Living two lives with one being a complete mystery to the people investigators have access to makes extracting leads and following clues a naturally tedious and borderline impossible task. Absorbing all of the information, interviews, and intelligence provided across the board by multiple private investigators, we've concluded that Phoenix Colton up and left Spanish Lake on her own accord, with the help of friends at first, using her pseudonym, Phoenix Reeves and the alternative birth certificate before building a completely new identity and dissolving into society under a new independent position of power. First, let's discuss the abandoned Chevy Blazer, the contents of the car, mostly junk and random garments, leaving no signs of illicit activity or foul play. The collection agency notice regarding Phoenix's unpaid burner phone bill that was discovered makes people question why she would leave it behind so carelessly. But ultimately it wouldn't matter because the phone was still under her name and easily accessible by authorities with investigative abilities. The vehicle itself looked parked and planted from first sight, according to Officer Perry and was most likely used as a decoy maneuver by Phoenix, whoever was helping her leave. Putting the Chevy in East St. Louis would make it seem like something criminal encountered Phoenix and lead searches on a wild goose chase when really it was more than likely camouflage. Once the car was set up, Phoenix most likely had another person drive her away or had another car at the ready. In addition, there's a chance that the Interstate 70 being so close as the trafficking highway of the U.S. was merely a coincidence. In reality, it being a nearby escape route for a quick departure. It's also important to note that East St. Louis is across state lines in Illinois, which would later prove to throw a wrench in the initial search for Phoenix and the vehicle within the automobile database. The second key to the maze is Phoenix's immense critical thinking skills and subtle resourcefulness. Known associates of Phoenix described her as able to make friends with just about anyone, allowing her to adapt to a variety of situations and befriend people with specific sets of services. It's not out of the realm of possibility that Phoenix met friends of friends who could assist with leaving the community and restarting an anonymous life. Now who these suspects might be and to the degree of their craft is unknown, but Phoenix did have a head start with two birth certificates. Using the Phoenix Reeves document for secret plans wouldn't be tracked right away at all and would buy her precious time. She could make purchases, apply for a new social security number, and access any number of resources outside of the Golden Legacy. She was obviously smart enough to hide a second cell phone plan from her family and some of her friends and could have had any number of other phones or communication methods. Remember, she was also intermittently stealing savings bonds from her family safe before moving back home, a potential method of collecting funds for her future departure. When the two private investigators, Joe Delia and Dean Duke discovered the Phoenix Reeves identification address in Anchorage, Alaska, they visited the neighborhood but came away empty-handed. Apparently, the woman who lived on the address under Phoenix Reeves owned the property during the month when Phoenix was linked to it from January to June 2012. However, this woman had never rented it out since purchasing it in 2002 and never saw anyone who looked like Phoenix during her 25-year residency. Yet something isn't right about this anomaly. 
It just so happens that Phoenix Reeves's profile had zero information points except for an address that was dated just one month after Phoenix disappeared and appeared to be a sensible runaway location. Nobody in Anchorage would recognize Phoenix if she did indeed travel there to hide or plan a further identity transformation and would serve as an excellent middle ground between the United States and starting anew in a foreign place like Japan. It also can't be ruled out that Phoenix paid off the woman who owned the house on record. Either way, we believe there's something very suspicious about Anchorage, Alaska, and concur she was definitely there at some point after her vanishing. In addition, many friends and connections to Phoenix have been less than welcome to reporters, investigators, and anyone looking for answers. While they haven't been necessarily silent, a lot of her friends simply do not want to talk. I in a sense, this could be analyzed as guilt behavior, but we feel that the guilt comes from their role in helping Phoenix, not hurting her, to pull off a feat like running away and becoming invisible. One would need help from the outside. Phoenix could have been using her new acquaintances as assistants in disappearing, including someone like Michael B. Their phone conversations increased in the weeks leading up to December 18th and ended with an abnormally long 116-minute call on December the 17th. We theorized a two-hour talk was a final discussion about the master plan, and the one-minute call on the 18th was Phoenix altering the plan's initiation seeing as though it was her final call on the family plan phone. Again, it's possible more calls were made on the burner phone, but without those records, it cannot be stated with 100% certainty. Finally, when drawing this conclusion, we must address Phoenix's emotional and mental state at the time of December 2011. Multiple friends described Phoenix as unlike her normal self. She was agitated, displeased, and uncomfortable. Her relationship with her mother became untenable at times, ending with arguments and disputes, but various topics as Phoenix spaced further and further away at church. Not to mention, Phoenix was constantly looking over her shoulder, regretting decisions in the past that took her down a path of present complications. Most telling of all was Phoenix's spoken wish in to start her life over, to reset her problems and return to the old version of herself. It's quite possible that she tried to do so in between November the 15th and December the 18th, with a couple of clues hinting at such efforts. However, it couldn't overcome the cloud of darkness that hung over her head. As her friendship with the Kira cracked and her paranoia skyrocketed, Phoenix was the product of an incredibly strict parenting style, sheltering her from real-world conflict and suppressing her social development. She was eager to expand her knowledge and experience life outside of the airtight rules found at the Golden Household. But over and over again, she was rejected of these desires by her parents. This slowly ate away at the connection she had with Gloria and Lawrence. And sadly, made it an easier decision to let go of the religious conservative front that everyone knew her by. Leaving in her eyes was most likely not an easy choice but a necessary decision to escape the decades of difficulties that eventually made life a losing battle.